Uh, there we go. We're on the air. Okay, so uh, this is our first live stream here at the Comedy Cellar. Um, <clears throat> let me welcome you all uh, to our first live stream. I told ChatGPT I didn't want to call it a debate, and ChatGPT recommended disputatious conversation, which I kind of like. So this is our disputatious conversation on Israel. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to mention that the Comedy Cellar is sponsoring what, as far as I can tell, will be the first serious uh, conversation of this kind with no fingers on the scale. You'd think this would be going on nightly all around the country, and I know Mr. Finkelstein has uh, um, actually, I've seen him, uh, urged people to call in with tougher questions, almost like he was itching to get an audience that wasn't built in for his side, and it's hard to get. Um, obviously, people who watch the show know that this issue is uh, tough for me because it's close to my heart, but um, I'm going to try to conduct this uh, down the middle and, and correctly. If I jump in in some way, uh, I don't think Mr. Finkelstein will mind because um, I think you could take on 10 comers and, and be fine with it from what, the way I've heard you uh, in the past. Um, so we're not going to have a formal debate uh, with resolutions and all that stuff. I'll ask some questions, and we can have an informal discussion. You guys can also uh, bring up whatever questions you want. As far as interruptions go, I'd ask for people to use discretion, try to control yourself if you can, but I do understand that interrupting is sometimes part of a, of a constructive conversation. So, um, and it's, uh, you know, we want some action also. So hopefully we can keep it to a, a wise level. I was thinking as far as potential, potential factual inaccuracies and mistakes, uh, I don't I don't want to uh, pretend that we don't live in the modern age. So after this is all over, if somebody wants to provide me, not with a citation, but with act an actual excerpt of something that they feel uh, uh, contradicts what someone else said, I would like to include these kinds of addendums in the final package of all this because it's got to be very frustrating to know that somebody said it's not true and then it lives on forever in some way. So I want to um, give every opportunity when this is finished and tied in a bundle to create a record that everybody feels uh, is accurate or at least um, accurate in terms of referring to the sources. Uh, do I have anything else I want to say here? Okay, so here we go. Eli Lake is an American journalist. He's a columnist for the Free Press, contributing editor to Commentary Magazine and host of the Re-Education podcast, which I listen to quite often and I think is fantastic. Thank you. Norman Finkelstein received his Ph.D. from the Princeton University Politics Department in 1987. He's the author of many books that have been translated into 60 foreign editions. In 2020, he was named the fifth most influential political scientist in the world for the years 2000 to 2020. His, his two most recent books are Gaza, An Inquest into Its Martyrdom, and I'll Burn That Bridge When I Get to It, which is a book where you take on the woke and uh, I, I've heard you in a bunch of interviews on that subject, and it was fantastic on, on, on that subject. Um, so I would recommend people checking that out, even if they don't agree with them about Israel. Okay, let's start. Um, in a recent post, this is obviously going to start with the, the, the Gaza attack, and then um, at some point, well, I'm sure we'll rewind all the way back to the, uh, the 19th century. So, in a recent post, you compared the Hamas attack on Israeli civilians to the Nat Turner slave rebellion. Uh, you wrote that Turner exhorted his fellow insurrectionists to kill all white people. You said a whole families, fathers, mothers, and daughters, sucking babies, and school children were butchered, thrown into heaps. And you say that Turner's rage was ascribed by white to his religious delir delirium so as to obscure the slave uprising's real taproot, not fanatical delusion, but the system of bondage that stoked the flames for vengeance. And then you continue to draw an analogy between Nat Turner, a psychological analogy, I would say, to uh, what happened with the Hamas uprising. And I'll, I'll read from it. Or I could let you read from it if you want, because, okay. The 2,000 young men who burst the gates of Gaza on October 7, 2023, had been born into a concentration camp. For fully two decades, they had been immured in a 25-mile-long in a by 5-mile-wide 
five-mile-wide sliver of land that was among the most densely populated places in the world. The vast majority of them could never hope to leave, but only to pace each day the camp's suffocating perimeter, never aspire to gainful employment or eat a full meal, never expect to marry or raise a family. Abandoned by everyone, they were remaindered to languish and die. To expedite this process, Israel periodically launched operations visiting death and destruction on Gaza. Thousands methodically mowed down. Homes and critical infrastructure systematically pulverized. It might sound like the script of a bad B-movie, but on the night of October 6th, each of those 2,000 men probably kissed his mother, then his father goodbye, forever. And then each silently vowed to vindicate the remorseless torture of a twilight existence and to avenge the murder of a grandparent, sister, brother, niece, nephew by that satanic power that cursed their lives. So you're offering what I think is a psychological defense there, somewhere along the lines of pleading down from premeditated murder through manslaughter, maybe even to some kind of justifiable homicide. So tell us about that and why, why you wrote that. <clears throat> On October 7th, when I first heard about the events, they were described as a, a Hamas members, militants, whatever you want. Uh, breaking through the gates of Gaza. And um, they estimated on the first day about 50 people were killed. It wasn't clear how they were killed, whether they were targeted, whether it was crossfire. Uh, so my initial reaction was people broke free of a concentration camp, an open-air prison, whichever term you prefer. Uh, and, of course, I was very sympathetic in fact, instinctively, I turned to that Civil War song, John Brown's Body Lies a Moldering in the Grave. And one of the lines, one of the lines in the lyrics is, the gods above in heaven are looking kindly down. But by day two or day three, it became clear that something different had happened, or at least something of a very different order of magnitude. And at that point, I had to, in my own mind, try to make a moral judgment as to what, uh, we don't know the details, but we know enough to know that something uh, of an atrocity of a significant magnitude had occurred. And at that point, I was at a loss for analogies. My first thought was my parents. They were in concentration camps during World War II. My father was in Auschwitz, and my mother was in Majdanek. So I tried to picture in my mind what would their verdict be on what happened. Uh, that was very speculative, though I'm pretty certain what their verdict would be, but we'll leave that aside because it is speculative. The next thing I did was, uh, recently I've been reading a lot of American history, in particular African American history, and everybody knows Nat Turner's Rebellion. It was the largest slave rebellion in American history. And it was, I knew it to be very gruesome. Actually, until I, st I read Stephen Oates' biography of Nat Turner, I didn't realize how gruesome it was. Uh, he gave the order to kill all whites, and they proceeded to behead a lot of babies. Uh, it was very ugly. Okay, now the analogy seemed close, though I don't think the evidence is in the Hamas militants beheaded Israeli babies. That's still a very gray area. But clearly there was a, a, a level of ugliness that the analogy seemed to hold. And then my next question is, okay, so what was the verdict, the historic verdict, on what happened with Nat Turner? And my first impulse was, okay, let me go see what the abolitionists had to say. The abolitionists referred to those heroic whites who gave over their lives to trying to end slavery. People like Charles Sumner, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, Thaddeus Stevens, um, and so forth. And what struck me when I went over to look at what they said, uh, when you look at, uh, for example, William Lloyd Garrison, who was the editor of that famous newspaper called The Liberator, uh, I was quite surprised, I have to say it was a kind of a relief for me, that whereas Garrison does state that atrocities had occurred, that horrors had unfolded. If you read closely every word of what he wrote, 
never once, it's very conspicuous, he never once condemned the slave revolt. He condemned all the hypocrites who suddenly became very pious about atrocities. He, he said that we warned you, we told you so, you leave these people in this condition, there's going to be a uh, catastrophe. Uh, and so when I read that, I felt that was the correct verdict. And then I went on to look at C.L.R. James, what he have to say about the Haitian Revolution, which whites were systematically targeted in very large numbers, very large numbers. And he said as well, what happened is clearly an atrocity, but he refused to condemn the slave uprising. And for me, uh, that was the right way to try to come to grips with what happened. Um, anybody, I have one advantage or disadvantage over virtually every other person listening to this program, and maybe every other person, not just virtually. That is, I spent the last 20 years reading through those human rights reports on Gaza, reading through the reports after each of Israel's massacres in Gaza, what it likes to call operations, reading through each of Israel's destruction, murderous destruction of the people trapped in Gaza, what they call, what Israelis like to call mowing the lawn each time it launches one of its murderous assaults. And people thought that was very funny, mowing the lawn. Isn't that cute? Isn't that clever? And then it occurred to me the other day you know what Hamas did on October 7th? It mowed the lawn. Is that funny? Is that funny? Is that an object of humor? Why does it suddenly become disgusting where to, if it describes what Hamas did? But since 2007, I'm not going to even leave, go through all the other massacres, even though I have a pretty good memory. I cannot try as I do, try as I may. I can't remember the names of all the massacres. Okay. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I want to, you know. Yes. Want to, so, and before I turn to, to Eli, um, <clears throat> when you say you were relieved, well, you were relieved to find that Garrison said that. You relieved yeah. why? I was relieved because, knowing as I do, after having studied the situation for two decades, knowing as I do the situation in Gaza. I couldn't find it in me to condemn the actions of those concentration camp victims. I couldn't okay. do it. Okay. So this issue of psychological frame of mind, I want to come back to this throughout this conversation because at every period, the actors we're going to talk about have their own psychology, and, and some of them may be comparable mm -hmm. to what you're describing. But go ahead, your response. Well, for those who are watching what you just heard from Mr. Finkelstein, is utterly demented and historically illiterate. The Gazans are not slaves. Gaza is not a concentration camp. And I have read your books, not all of them, but I have read enough. And you rely selectively only on the most anti-Israel sources, and you never account for the agency of the criminal gang that currently runs Gaza. And so this allows you to make these, you know, performative moral judgments, comparing it to Nat Turner's slave rebellion or what have you. But you are only able to do this because although you have assembled voluminous amounts of information, you have been totally unwilling to ever ascribe any agency to the people that have started this latest war and have started so many of these other wars. So in that respect, I, um, I, I have to say that I'm at a loss as to why um, you just insist on describing the world's only Jewish state in such demonic terms. And it has consequences because I believe that the people who have joined these demonstrations shouting from the river to the sea, in some cases celebrating this massive brutality, they are in many ways your children and grandchildren, intellectually speaking. 
because you have provided a kind of narrative and framework for, to, to not only delegitimize, but to really demonize the only Jewish state. It is a standard to which no other country is held, and you have decided to do it. Does Israel kill innocent civilians? Yes, every army does. But your telling of this story, that every single time the Palestinians are victims and have no role whatsoever in provoking these kinds of conflicts or even being an actor in any of these kinds of conflicts, and your massing of evidence that only seems to go against Israel and never seems to sort of acknowledge things that almost everybody else who has looked at this has knowledge, such as the use of human shields by Hamas, it's, I think it, it really, it's self-discrediting. That's what I would say. Okay. Let me ask you a yeah, question. Sure. So he, he's bringing up s s psychology, and in the yeah. law we recognize psychology. You told me earlier today about a story about when the concentration camps were liberated, how yes. they, they came and they murdered the, the, the soldiers. Justifiably. What's that? Justifiably. Justifiably. So where do you feel that his analogy fails? Because not everybody knows these facts the way you do. Well, I mean, first of all, Israel has provided fuel. Israel has provided electricity. Israel has provided water. And it is this, this notion that there is this siege of Gaza, which is so inhumane. I've been to Gaza. Granted, I was there 10 years ago. You can find luxury hotels. You can find shopping centers. And you can find incredibly impoverished um, refugee camps. Now, there are probably a lot of reasons, and I think Israel does have some responsibility for the poor conditions in those camps. However, why is it that in your analysis, you do not blame the group that siphons off development aid, that has done everything it can to, um, well, let's just say, immiserate Palestinians, in the sense that not only do they rule the Gaza Strip, um, as you would expect fanatic fascists would, but they also start these wars which Israel retaliates. So you look at this massacre and you say, aha, they were mowing the lawn. I look at this massacre and I say, you are a false friend of the Palestinians. This was an obvious sort of decision from Hamas with no consultation from the people of Gaza themselves. And by the way, Hamas is underneath Gaza City in tunnels, uh, somewhat secure from the aerial bombardment. They have stockpiled food and fuel, of course, which uh, they are not giving to the average citizens. They knew that there would be a response, especially something this vicious. So, of course, you are explaining away the worst pogrom against Jews since the Holocaust. But you are also, it's a slur against Palestinians. If you think this is some sort of authentic representation of what Palestinians want, you think that they want this kind of thing? You think that they, this would not provoke a response from a far more powerful military? Is it an authentic representation of Ham the psychology of the, the people in Hamas who did this? I, the people in Hamas, I mean, what are we talking about? This is, I mean, a terrorist is an overused word. I think that we have to look at Hamas right now as uh, an organization of Anders Brevix. It's a mass, it's a group of mass shooters at this point. So again, if you care about the Palestinians, why have you never devoted a single word to getting rid of this disgusting fascist organization that rules over them and immiserates them? All right, Mr. Finkelstein. <laughs> Well, the people who rule over Gaza are, I agree with you, a disgusting fascist organization. They're called the State of Israel. Gaza is legally not even any longer occupied territory. Israel has been, uh, Gaza has been illegally annexed by Israel according to international law. But we'll leave that aside and let's turn to the facts. Now, there seems to be an objection to my describing what's happening in Gaza as a concentration camp. Yes. And there seems to be an objection because I'm not giving enough agency to the people of Gaza. So let's look at the facts. Because as facts as the British adage goes, facts are stubborn things. So let's look at the basic facts. Number one, what is Gaza? Gaza is 25 miles long, less than the length of a marathon, and Gaza is five miles wide. That is the distance from where we are now on West 4th Street 
NYU to Columbia University, 116th Street. So if you imagine a marathon by the distance from here to Columbia University, that's Gaza. That's the width. I, I heard it described it as big as Manhattan plus the Bronx plus Hoboken. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Which, which that seems bigger to me than... Okay, no. Uh, and I want to get it accurately. Uh, yeah. you, we want to be accurate, yeah. but I don't think there's any dispute. It's 25 miles long by five miles wide. Yes. Okay. Gaza is among the most densely populated places on God's earth. It's more populated than Tokyo. The population of Gaza is 2.3 million people. Of those 2.3 million people, 70% are refugees or descendants of refugees. That is Palestinians who were expelled from Israel in 1948. Approximately uh, 290,000 ended up in Gaza. And so they're those refugees, their children, and their grandchildren. Gaza, a fact that should be of interest and concern to your listeners, Gaza is over half children. Can, can, can I pause it? Yeah. Just so I understand. So when you say it's, it's densely populated, mm -hmm. what should I be picturing? I know, I know it's, it's less des densely populated than Manhattan during the day. It's, it's around like mm -hmm. London. Gaza City is much more dense than... Mm -hmm. but, but how does this dense population actually bring itself to bear on day-to-day -day life? I mean, I've seen videos of it. It seems mm -hmm. like a normal kind of city... Well, I, I, I've only been to Gaza a few times, but I don't think it's correct to describe it as a normal city uh, in terms of its density. And I don't want to get into quarrels about that. I said I would start with the facts. And I think it's universally... Yeah, but we, we have no way to gauge what yeah, density means. Right. And I'm trying to, I'm I'm trying to picture it. I'm saying it's universally described as, quote, among the most densely populated places on Earth, and more densely populated than Tokyo. Beyond that, I don't want yeah, to get... Yeah, but Tokyo is a fine, fun city to live in. That's what right. I'm saying. So why right. is that well, so that, terrible? Okay, <laughs> so that's what we're going yeah. to get to now. Yeah, okay, sorry. That's what we're going to get to now. Yeah. So as we proceed, let's bear in mind, as I said, that the population is half children. I'm just going to jump ahead for a moment, and then I'm going to get back to Gaza, or the, the, the details of Gaza. Okay. Uh, in the past three weeks, Israel has killed about 3,500 children in Gaza. That's more children have been killed in Gaza than all the war zones in the world combined for the years 2020, 2021, and 2022. The last time more children were killed in, a, in, a, in the total war zones in the world was in 2019. Okay, now let's get back to your question. Tokyo is a fun city. Maybe. I've not been there, but I'll take your word for it. Is Gaza fun? Let's see. I'm just referring to the density, yeah. to be fair. Okay. Yeah. I'm not trying to be unfair. I'm just trying to quote you. Right, but okay. I, I was trying to picture yeah, the density. Not, obviously, in other ways, the comparison We're not going to quibble yeah, over, yeah, yeah. Quibble over those things. Yeah. So, in 2006, there was an election in Gaza. The election was urged on the Palestinians, among others, by President George Bush. Hamas, surprisingly, decided to participate in the election. Originally, it was against all the elections because it was under the aegis of the Oslo Accord they didn't want to participate. They decided to participate. Surprise to everybody, they won. Because the Palestinian Authority, the administrative unit in Gaza, is hyper-corrupt. People wanted to change, not something Americans can easily understand. And they voted to elect Hamas into office. Uh, former President Jimmy Carter was among the uh, monitors of the election. He pronounced the election completely honest and fair. The day after the election results came in, Israel imposed a brutal blockade on Gaza. Hmm. That blockade was then uh, reinforced by the e EU and the United States. Can he get in here now? To, to okay, okay, go ahead. I take notes. He can take notes. I'm even okay, happy okay, okay. to present them with paper and a pen. That's fine. Okay, so, so now... 
now, in 2006, the blockade was imposed on Gaza. So now let's get to the question of agency, okay? Nothing can go into Gaza and nothing can leave Gaza without Israel's permission. No one can go into Gaza and no one can leave Gaza without Israel's permission. Israel controls the, water, the uh, surrounding water. Israel controls the airspace. Now, here is fun Gaza. 20, um, 50 percent of the population is unemployed. 60 percent of the children, of the young people, 60 percent of the young people are unemployed. Half the population in Gaza is classified by international humanitarian organizations as suffering from, quote, extreme food insecurity. That's Gaza. Now, people like to talk about Hamas. You know, the, I've, I've looked up that yeah. fact, and there's a very high, almost similar, I think, st stat that they give about America in terms of food insecurity. So it's not the uh -huh. same thing as starvation. It's some sort uh, of poverty measure. There, yeah, but, but I don't there mean are to different, there are different yeah. gradations. Yeah. I refer to extreme food insecurity, yeah. and that applies to about half the population of Gaza. I, I interrupted only because it's another one of these adjectives like density, mm -hmm. which it, it has a it evokes something, but we yeah. don't really know what that means. And uh, you know, I, I just try to really yeah. picture: are they are they hungry? Are they are they not hungry? But you know, they, they're not quite sure where where the next dollar is coming from. Mm -hmm. These kind of things. The essence okay. of truth I'm trying to get to. So we talk about Hamas as this kind of, uh, I guess it was called fascist organization. Uh, Hamas, the, the people who burst through the gates of Gaza, uh, they were over overwhelmingly about 20, 21, 22 years old. That means they were born into the concentration camp. They had never seen anything else. And there was no prospect of ever seeing anything else. So what was, uh, what was the surprise that people who were born into a concentration camp, half of whom have never seen a full meal in their lives, what is the surprise that they would be as Nat Turner was, one of the things that struck me when I read his biography was Nat Turner happened to have been a very smart guy. He, very because smart. It, only because we were a half an hour yeah. and we only have on our first question, okay. so it, no okay, disrespect. I'm just, uh, yeah, I mean. No, no yeah. problem. Yeah. I'm saying that these young men should be consumed by rage and fury, not just at their own lives, having been destroyed, but those periodic operations. In Operation Cast Lead, Israel killed 1,400 people, 350 of them children. Operation Protective Edge, Israel killed 2,200 people, 550 of them children. And then you can go through the house demolitions and so forth. And then for me to hear in the midst of that, what about agency? It's as if to say in the, in the Warsaw Ghetto, mm. what about the agency of the Judenrat? Well, they had some agency. I will agree with that, the Jewish Council. I'm not going to dispute that. Professor, but at the end of the day, really, let's be honest. How much agency did the Jewish councils have? Okay, let, let's let, let Eli come on. Well, again, um, thank you for your historical illiteracy. There is no comparison between what the Nazis did to exterminate six million Jews and what Israel has done to try in the last, say, 16 years to deal with a fascist, fanatic organization that is on their border that has turned the Gaza Strip into essentially a military weapons factory to attack Israel in any way that it could. And so you speak of these, and 
listen, it is tragic in war when people are killed and civilians are killed, and this is sadly a fact of war. But where in your story do you account for the fact that Hamas has broken ceasefires, launched rockets, launched missiles to times, and kidnapped soldiers, and now massacred 1,400 civilians in cold blood. These are very different decisions than the Warsaw Ghetto. And to even make the comparison is not only insulting to the memory of the Warsaw partisans, um, because they never did anything like that. They never sort of went on a murderous rampage, as you described. But it's also insulting, again, to the Palestinians. I believe that you are a false friend. You are not their ally. You pretend to be the one documenting this great crime in all of your exaggerations and inaccuracies. But what you really are doing is you are saying, they, wh what can we expect from them? Of course they're going to act like these savage barbarians. And you justify it. And I say, no, there are other explanations. A lot of this, and maybe we can play the clip now of um, some of this Hamas television. Here's an effort to try to brainwash Gazans into this disgusting ideology. You had one here about children. You have that yep. one that says children? Yeah. You want to play that? Yeah. These are children's programs that um, are produced by Hamas. Here we go. Let's, let's watch this. Make sure I have sound. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's in Arabic, so. Don't let it keep, keep going. Is that the end of it? Having a technical problem? So, Pre well, it, it, can you try it again, Nicole? Press play. That's the end? Okay, so cut. I mean, we, we can show the one where they, they talk about Jews as apes and pigs. M might as well get it out. Just, is, because sure. this, is, this is, this is, um... Do they call them human animals, by the way? Well, I think that Hamas are human animals. Mm -hmm. Do you disagree? Do you disagree that the people uh, who would say, do such uh, a thing are human animals? I, I, I think wanna, human animals I, I, I are charitable. I, I want to get back to the points that you made. But play play, play well, the apes and pigs only because... If, 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 if we're going the if human we're, animals while we're playing apes well, and pigs, let's play. I, I'm, human I, you know what? I, I looked. I, go ahead. Play the apes and pigs. The human animals. I, I, I mean, I do have that quote here from. Uh, ah, here we go. <laughs> Maybe, you allow me, since many points were made, unfortunately, rarely documented, but I'm not going to get into that now also. Uh, I want to just... So, so, so the, the human animals, since you asked for it, you said mm -hmm. that Gideon Levy had described them as less than animals. As you said it, that too. No, uh, that was Gideon Levy. Yeah, but the Israeli government on the first day called them human animals. The, we're talking about the uh, defense minister, and he was yeah, referring yeah, to yeah. Hamas. He said, right. we are fighting. Yeah, and well, as I said a moment ago, Let's try to figure out who this Hamas let, let is. Me, let me put this in, because since you've been, yeah. so yeah, I, I watched you on Aaron Mate's show, and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. friendly with Aaron. And you did, uh, you did, Katie talked about the defense minister, and there is that quote which, um, mm -hmm. he talks about the people that they're fighting, but then you said, well, Gideon Levy, Gideon Levy also described them as less than That's animals. Correct. But then I read what he wrote, and he wrote, animals isn't even an appropriate term for the crimes mm -hmm. committed by the Hamas invaders on Saturday. That's no correct. animal convicts. And then he goes Hamas on. invaders. Then he goes on. Gaza is plagued with Hamas, and Hamas is, despic is a despicable yes. organization, but most residents of the Gaza Strip are not like that. Mm -hmm. So the whole point of his column, as I read it, was to say that 
yes, Hamas is worse than animals, but let's never right. extend and that to the people of Gaza. That's the point yeah, that right. I've been making to right. you, Norman. You right. said something otherwise. Not, not wanting to quarrel. I think the whole point of what I just said a few moments, moments ago was let's look at what Hamas is. Let's look at those 2,000 militants. So I'm willing to acknowledge they are Hamas. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out uh, what is, who are these people? So now let's turn to what um, Mr. Lake had to say. Uh, I've documented very great length the whole issue of who broke the various ceasefires since 2006. I'm not going to go through the details now because oh, there'll please, be a dis there'll be Look, I'm very happy to. If you would like me to go through the details. No, we don't have time, but you, but right. you, but you, can, okay. you can send them to me and then you can send them to Eli and then I'll, right. I'll include. Uh, uh, let, but let, let, let's go. Give us the, the, the key, like a, let, a, an point. example of a, okay. a major one. So let's take Operation Cast Lead. Mm. In June 2008, there was a ceasefire signed between Hamas and Israel. It wasn't signed, it was unofficial. A uh, ceasefire. You look at any of the sources, any of the sources, that ceasefire held until t November 4th, 2008. November 4th, 2008, Israel went into uh, Gaza and killed eight militants knowing full well what the consequence would be. There is no dispute. See, one of the problems, Eli, is I don't think you read very carefully. I'm not mm. going to resort to the juvenile insults that you hurl at me because they're frankly beneath me. Mm. But you say that I only use Hamas sources or selective I, I use, that. Selective you use, use UN, you yeah. use human rights I groups use, that are I, biased. Right, what I, what I use is every available respected source on the topic. I use Amnesty International. I use Human Rights Watch. What do you use? I've gone through all the sources across the spectrum. And one of the things that's quite remarkable about the Israel-Palestine conflict is there is a broad consensus among all respected human rights organizations about how Israel carries on in Gaza. Let's take one basic- I don't think Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International are I know, human rights I know, but you see, you didn't, t you didn't really answer what I said, so I'll repeat myself. Well, I, I use said, Hamas people I said, themselves. I can, I said I'm happy to tell a, you their quote. I said there is a broad consensus among all respected human rights organizations as to how Israel conducted itself and also as regards the blockade of Gaza, which is characterized by all human rights organizations. In fact, it's um, all of them describe the blockade as a war crime. Richard Goldstone described the, Ga uh, the Gaza blockade as likely a crime against humanity. Now, here is the question I'm going to put to you very simply. But then he withdraw. He, he yes, walked he that would, report back. He he walked the report back. That is absolutely correct. He did not, however, not to go into fine points. He did not reject that particular finding. He rejected other findings. He didn't reject that particular finding. Everybody, every human rights organization, describes the blockade as a form of collective punishment that rises to a war crime. But let's leave aside... But he, the, but he did retract what he considered to be the most serious he, finding of the 29 uh, people killed in the home, right? Uh, let's say he was willing to accept that Israel had made a case before Israel itself had made a definitive finding. But I'm, I, I'm going to lose the listeners. I'm sorry, and I, go ahead, go And ahead. I don't want to lose the listeners. So I'm going to just make three quick comments. Okay. Two, two, three quick make comments. Make it quick so we can get on to the Yes. Yeah. Number one, I would like uh, Eli to point to a source that I ignored in my research. You say I was selective. 
Now, everybody should listen carefully. What is my selectivity? According to Eli, it's Human Rights Watch, it's Amnesty International, it's Beth Selim, the Israeli Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, it's all the UN organizations. So now let's hear Eli list the impartial human rights and humanitarian organizations that I selectively omitted. Because frankly, I would be curious. Okay, okay. I, I'm, I'm very happy to answer. Mm -hmm. In your book, uh, Inquest into Mart It's Martyrdom on Gaza, you have a chapter devoted to the concept that you believe you are debunking the idea that Hamas uses human shields in its various wars that it starts with Israel, which you do not think they start. Well, can we play the clip of the recent Hamas guy talking about um, the uh, why they don't build bomb shelters and so forth? I mean, I can sh I'm I'm basing this on what Hamas itself said. I have, okay. They urge Palestinians to go on the rooftops yeah. when Israel is bombing. We don't build yeah. bomb yeah. So that's, that's that's that's. Why don't we play that? That is, there was a case. It is correct. There was a case where Israel targeted a civilian home for demolition. And then, I cannot say now with certainty, because my memory is not perfectly clear on it, but either they were urged, Palestinians were urged, to save their home by going on the rooftop because it was targeted for demolition. That's not human shielding. I don't think Eli- but That's not what e I'm Eli talking okay. about. They said, they, listen, they, they constantly uh, no, you talk can't about just, the importance of martyrdom. E they e constantly, Eli, like you're picking e on, like- Eli, this. Eli, Eli, you can't, yeah. uh, uh, I assume that you have some academic or scholarly background. You can't just say they all the time do. Come that's on. Not, that's not serious. You oh. Have to, no, you have to present documentation which then the listener can Let's verify. The okay, Let's okay. play the clip. He had, there's three videos there's here he has. Video. One says, we don't build bomb shelters. Well, Let's that first. Is, uh, and uh, then, uh, we can't see it, Nicole. And then mm -hmm. the other one should be uh, uh, human shields one, human shields two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> وهذا سؤال رائج وشائع يعني من قام بتشييد 500 كيلومتر من الأنفاق لماذا لم يشيد مآوي يلجأ إليها المدنيون خلال القصف نحن شيدنا الأنفاق لأنه لا نملك ما ندفع به عن أنفسنا من القتل والاستهداف هذه الأنفاق من أجل أن نحمي أنفسنا من الطائرات نحمي مقاتلين من من الأنفاق أما أما القطاع غزة فأنت تعلم والجميع يعلم بأن 75% منه لاجئين واللاجئين هو مسؤولية الأمم المتحدة في حمايتهم مسؤولية الاحتلال في أن يقدم كل تبعا لاتفاقية جنيف الدولية أن يقدم لهم كل الخدمات وهم تحت الاحتلال Get all, you know, then Maybe before we move uh, on, pause, what was objectionable about what he said? I'm not sure. There's something apparently revelatory in that video. Now, memory is notorious. Uh, memory, the tra alleged translators, are notoriously untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to leave, leave, leave that aside. L let me just I, tell you I, about I'm that. Curious, on, on, what, I, I did a podcast a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. where I played some memory videos, and I actually asked an Arabic friend of mine to check the translation mm -hmm. on four of them, and he said they were correct. So uh, yes, that doesn't mean you can generalize that, it for all of them. But, right, yeah. that is correct. Yeah. But the context in the memory video the editing, I can't is notorious. Yeah. Yes, is notorious. But yeah. I'm not going to quarrel about okay. that because I couldn't see what was incorrect so, yes. in what he said. My parents. Well, let, let him answer. No, just as a factual matter, my parents were in the Warsaw Ghetto, and guess what the Jewish fighting organization did. The Jewish fighting organization built tunnels in Gaza. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> tunnels in the Warsaw Ghetto. They were called the bunkers. Anybody who knows, I know it from my parents, but I also know it from having read all the books on the Warsaw Ghetto. 
So Norman, building did, condos. Was there like a, a international the, aid to the Warsaw Ghetto? Yeah. Was uh, they, they're no, giving I'm a saying, I'm sorry. So, it's such a ridiculous so I, analogy. So when hold, hold on, hold on. Let, we played the video. The memory of the Shoah. It's played, unbelievable. We, we, you would, you would Eli, view this garbage. I'm sorry. We, we played the video, so, and he asked, you, he asked you, enough. so what did okay. the video prove? So go ahead, answer his question. Well, I think what the video proves is that Hamas has quite a lot of resources to build mm -hmm. tunnels in which they can launch these abduction operations and kill various uh, Israeli civilians. They have plenty of money to stockpile fuel. They have plenty of money to build their rockets and missiles. They have plenty of money to buy paragliders and so forth to pull off these military operations, mm -hmm. but they apparently don't have enough money and they don't even consider it their own responsibility to build bomb shelters for their own population when they start wars knowing that Israel is going to bomb. So this is why I really think that it's very important that we establish here that Hamas has all of Gaza captive. Now you get no argument from me that innocent civilians are killed in these wars. That is true. But when you just completely rip the context away and not recognize mm. that for Hamas, dead Palestinians are a war aim. Mm -hmm. And that right there is why I believe that you are not an ally of the Palestinians. You are an ally of Hamas. All right, let's let's play the the other two human shield videos. Absolutely, let's play. Now, one of them was from an interview I did with Rashid Khalidi and he acknowledged that it was legit. Mhm. Mm um, and that the guy in it was a was a, a a real dude. Is that the beginning of the call? <laughs> Obviously, to an American ear, we would never hear such a thing. The children and the women go fight, get bloody. So yeah. how do you, that, that to me sounds like somebody advocating for the, for the civilians to become part of the, the carnage. What I see there, and again, I have to be careful about uh, the translation. Well, that's why afterwards, yeah. you have my word of no, honor. I, 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 I'm not going to quarrel with you. Okay. I'm not going to argue because I'm not in a position to argue. I don't know Arabic. Uh, as I would understand that, I'm not going to, first of all, I'm not going to defend Hamas, not because I'm afraid to, but because it's not a source I would ever use uh, in trying to document the case. So uh, I'm not going to try to defend Hamas. Uh, that statement he made could also be interpreted as meaning that we are all prepared to get, we are prepared, all of us, to give our lives for the cause. Um, is that a good statement? I'm not, I'm not sure if it's a good or a bad statement. I would say that there are many cases in history where people have expressed a willingness to fight and die for it's, the cause. It's, it's not what he says, though, okay, to be fair. He no, no, says I, they I, are I, human I, shields. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm not sure. I would have to. Okay. 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 I don't know that. What I do know, allow me to finish. Please. Because go ahead. I don't want to drop the point. Go ahead. Uh, there is, as you can imagine, as you can imagine, there's an extensive human rights record on the question of human shields. So let's just see what the record shows. Uh, here, let's see. And then we'll move on to another thing, okay? Mm -hmm. Allow me one moment. Take your time. Mm -hmm. we, we can cut this out. Uh, people watching live stream, but we can cut pauses mm -hmm. out of the final video, so take all the time you need. Okay. So, um, I went through the record of human shielding in great detail. And now I'm going to quote what Amnesty wrote. 
Okay, Amnesty International investigated the question. Contrary to repeated allegations by Israeli f officials of the use of human shields, Amnesty found no evidence that Hamas or other Palestinian fighters directed the movement of civilians to shield military objectives from attacks. Can I ask you a question now? Yes. What if they didn't direct them? What if they mm -hmm. just put all their materials mm -hmm. where the other side would have no choice but to kill civilians? You know, that, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a very fair question. If I can just repeat your question. He, uh, Noam is your name? Noam, yeah. Noam is making a distinction between what's what you might call the strict definition of human shielding, where you conscript a civilian to protect you or protect others uh, from enemy fire. And then you turn to another possibility. The other possibility is, is Hamas locating itself in areas and firing from areas where it would be likely that civilians would be killed. And under international law, not to get into too any technicalities, under international law, that's called not taking sufficient caution to protect civilians. So let's look at what Amnesty International had to say about that. Oh, you were ready for it. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> as I said, yeah. I believe in facts. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. You, you believe let, in let, Amnesty International let, reports. Okay. Let, let's, let's see what Amnesty International had to say. The attacks that caused the greatest number of fatalities and injuries were carried out with long-range precision munitions fired from combat aircraft, helicopters, and drones, or from tanks stationed up to several kilometers away, often against pre-selected targets, a process that would normally require approval from up the chain of command. Now listen carefully to what Amnesty says. The victims of these attacks were not caught in the crossfire of battles between Palestinian militants and Israeli forces, nor were they shielding militants or other legitimate targets. Now listen carefully. Many were killed when their homes were bombed while they slept. Others were going about their daily activities in their homes, sitting in their yard, hanging the laundry on the roof, All right. when they were targeted in airstrikes or tank shelling. So when you if you take is, just, is your contention If you take just the current Israeli genocide in Gaza, and I'll be perfectly willing to defend the term should you want me to, Please. In the current genocide in Gaza, the statistics show of the 8,000 people thus far killed, 3,200 killed. What are you basing that on? Actually, I have it right here. <laughs> the Gaza <laughs> ministry? The number. No, 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 I'm sorry. I think I just said, Eli, it's very unwise, imprudent to use cheap tactics with me. It won't work. What's the cheap I tactic? Just, well, I just said, Eli... I would never cite a Hamas source. Excellent. Okay? So, according to the most recent statistic, allow me one second, I have it. Um, how, do, how do they get statistics other than through Hamas? That's what I'm wondering. Well, uh, I'll get to that in a moment. Okay. In the last of the 8,000 killed, 3,000 children, over two-thirds of the casualties were killed in their homes. Now, According I'm, to I'm going to get to that because I have no fear. Wonderful. I have no fear of truth or facts, none. Now, that was the Gaza Ministry of Health. That's correct. Okay, so you just the, told me... Yes, allow me to finish. Allow me to finish. Human Rights Watch and several other, including The Economist, by the way, they have said that if you compare the statistics that are produced by the major human rights organizations with the ones produced by the Gaza Ministry of Health, that they are, there are very, what they said there was 
very comparable. They're, they were comparable. They were close. Now, I have studied it closely. I have footnotes that take up three quarters of a page going through all the sources. And I would say, because people have asked me that question, if you were to put it on the spectrum, the Israeli numbers are at one extreme. And then at the other spectrum from the center over, they mostly cluster in the same area, including the Gaza Ministry of Health. However, I would say the Gaza Ministry of Health would be the highest. I will acknowledge that. But as all the human rights organizations have said, that there is no, I'll use the expression they use because it just came back to me, there is no big discrepancy between the Gaza, human, uh, Gaza Ministry of Health numbers and the uh, numbers right. used well, by the human well, rights what, human By, by what factor is your, is your intuition that they should discount these statistics? I don't have any particular opinion on the statistics other than in a war that is now, what, three and a half weeks old, that the, the, the numbers of casualties are not going to probably be accurate. And if you are interested in the facts, it's probably best to wait. Um, but it, I, as acknowledged, there are lots of civilian casualties in war, and it is a terrible tragedy. And... I'm not going to necessarily, I don't know what the numbers are. I was interested in it because you made it a point to say you don't take Hamas statistics. I don't. Okay. Well, the Gaza Ministry of Health is pretty much The Hamas. Gaza Ministry of Health is a civilian organization. Run by Hamas. Uh, well, I'm not going to quarrel with that. Okay. Well, they, they, did, they did count up 471 people <laughs> in the hospital, and then it turned out that it was only the parking lot, and a, the French uh, no, group found no, fewer, no, fewer no, than 50. No, so that no, was no. With all due regard, I don't know you. I did speak to Aaron Maté, and he said you're a nice guy. That so, wasn't a not nice thing to say. Yeah. I'm, I'm, the Gaza Health Ministry yeah. said 471. So, yeah. Yeah. so uh, let's be clear about these things, okay? Yeah. I said to you that when the atrocity happened on October 7th, the original number given out was 50, okay? I followed the numbers very closely, okay? It went from 50, it then went the next day to 100. The next day it went to 200. It wasn't until about a week and a half later that the number went up to 13 to 1400. But nobody says anything about the reliability of Israeli statistics. Even though, because it's an open society, no, no, you have you have no, artists there no, no, investigating right, this kind no, of stuff. No, no, even though the number changed, well, you could do the math yourself. The number right. changed by a factor of not ten, the fact it changed by a factor of twenty-five. Okay, so now you take the case. Are you uh, skeptical of the Israeli numbers? Uh, okay, uh, I will say. At this point, having looked, re read, but as I said, it's very, it's too soon to tell, uh, the numbers on who was responsible for the deaths, I would say we have to wait and see what investigations oh, show. Oh, tell me more. Yeah, well, I don't know how many were killed in cross You know they videotaped it. Right. You know they no. go it. Okay, I'm not going to argue, because as I said, I am willing to acknowledge an atrocity of a large magnitude occurred, and I also said on the details, things like beheadings, rapes, and how many were killed by which side in the course of the firefights, I don't know yet. But I'm not going to argue because I said I will begin by saying I acknowledge an atrocity of a large but magnitude. But do, do you accept occurred. a different point that, that Israel has a robust but, free press uh, and they have people there who are trying to sniff this out. They're, they're reporters I, motivated to get to the bottom I, of whether no, the Israeli government no, is lying I, to I, it, I, I, and that doesn't right, exist on the no, other side of the board. I have to say to you, in all honesty, I have, as I said, uh, I'm of the old school. My school is never quarrel with facts. I was very perplexed, and I don't want to sound like I'm denying. I'm just saying perplexed. Israel has what's ranked as among the best first responder uh, systems in the world, okay? Now, most of the deaths were supposedly happen on the first day. So how did a country with 
among the best first responder systems in the world where most of the bodies had to have gone directly either to the hospital or to the morgue, one or the other, best first responder system in the world. How did the number keep growing from 50 to 100 to 200 to 300 until finally, about a week and a half later, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, but I, but I will answer you this. So, and I, 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 don't, I will answer this because it mm-hmm. reminds me of this, that in the past, you used similar arguments to argue that the Iron Dome system was actually mm-hmm. a fraud yeah. and that the Hamas rockets were nothing more than fireworks. Correct. I don't think you stand by those positions still. I, okay, so that no, kind of deductive reasoning can, no, can lead you no, to, to no, the wrong no. conclusion. First of all, I would not describe my, what I do as deductive reasoning. No, just that was deductive reasoning, right. not your other things, that particular thing. Which, when you say which particular thing? When you say, well, how did the first responders, it went from 50 to 100, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I, I said You're it does deducing from it, it that right, it, No, yeah. I'm not deducing. Wait a second, no, I'm, let's be clear. Okay. I'm not deducing anything from it. I said I am perplexed okay. by that fact. No deductions whatsoever. As to the question of Iron Dome, I went through the record very, very carefully on Iron Dome. Now, this time, I will admit, I have been completely overwhelmed by people contacting me, calling me, and I haven't been able to do what I did for Operation Protective Edge uh, in uh, 2014. Namely, for me, the critical question as to the effectiveness of the Hamas quote-unquote rockets, and maybe now they are real rockets, I don't know. But the critical question would be property damage, because you can't judge their effectiveness by number of civilian deaths because Israel has a very good civil defense system, so people can go into shelters. So for me, the critical variable was property damage. And I've not been able yet... But I can't understand that, because Mm -hmm. what you're suggesting is that Hamas is sending up fireworks, projectiles mm-hmm. that they know won't do any damage, mm-hmm. that's a, a lot of people, mm-hmm. and that the entire Israeli defense establishment mm-hmm. knows this mm-hmm. and is sending up Iron Dome that it's spending millions and mm-hmm. millions of dollars on that mm-hmm. they also know is just a charade, mm-hmm. and that this massive conspiracy... I don't think it's a massive Well, it has to be. You have to have hundreds well, of people well, who know about okay. this. From, from, okay. from the rocket scientists, from, from, the, from, from every aspect of the chain well, actually, that builds them, uh, all the way through, you'd have okay. to have knowledge of this. Okay. As it happens... From the people, the people who yeah. sign off it, on the fake testing you, it of were them? were firecrackers or fireworks? Yeah. Is that what uh, you're... Well, actually, um, I was quoting somebody else, and there's a, a, a military expert calling them basically bottle rockets by comparison. But let me just get... Uh, can, 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 can we can we pause on this and get onto mm-hmm. something completely different? And let, because we, well, I, I would like to I would like to just uh, go go to one question, which I think is significant. It'll be significant. And then let's wrap this up because there's yeah. so much more to talk about. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's how you characterize what's been happening since October 8th, whether to characterize it as a war, or to characterize it as I think, and just I don't want to you know, to- toot my horn, but I do teach international law. I teach the laws of war, or whether to characterize it as a genocide. So let's see the facts, and then, you know, we can, qu- we can dispute them, argue about them. Uh, compact, so what, compact them, yeah. Okay, so what are the facts? On October 8th, three statements were made by Israeli leading officials. Statement number one was by Defense Minister Galant. Galan said, we're not going to admit any water, fuel, or electricity, or food into Gaza. Statement number two was made by the president of Israel, Mr. Herzog. Mr. Herzog said, we do not acknowledge any distinction between Hamas fighters and the civilian population. Statement number three... Not with regard to uh, uh, killing them. No, that's exactly what he said. If you look at even the headline of the Huffington Post... You can check it yourself. Uh, they headline it as, they headline it, just go Huffington Post, civilians legitimate targets. Okay? That was Mr. Herzog. And now statement number three is the statement by Mr. Netanyahu. He said, this is going to be a long war. It's going to be our longest war. 
Now, I'll assume he wasn't going back to June 1982, the two and a half month so called. Not, not now, Nicole, because I want to read it. I want to let, let um, not that I'm trying to hide it, but I want to give Eli a chance to right. uh, look at it before we put, okay. put up the headline. The, so, the question is what's in the details. Yeah, I, I looked at the details. Yeah, I know. I'm sure you did. Yes. And he said that the people of Gaza voted for Hamas and they're responsible for what Hamas does. Because he was explaining, excuse me for raising my voice. That's okay. He was explaining why they were legitimate targets. Now, statement number three, as I said, was by Netanyahu that this was going to be the longest war, which means Operation Protective Edge was 51 days. Okay? So now you add those three statements up no food, no water. No electricity. But, but they get water from no, the ground wells. No, right? they don't. 97% of the water is poisonous from the ground wells. 97% is poisonous. According to? According to everybody. No, because CNN, I mean, there's CNN so reported much something There's so different. much research done on the water situation okay. Okay. in Gaza. I'm, I'm no expert in okay. Gaza, but I saw 97% is not fit for human consumption. It's not potable. Okay. Okay? So now you add those three sentence, uh, statements up, and what do you get? It means the entire human po population of Gaza, mm. of whom more than one million are children, they will not have access to food, they will not have access to water, they will not have access to fuel or electricity, which means all the hospitals will be inoperative. The hospitals cannot operate without the fuel. We are also told that the entire population is a legitimate target for the Israeli army. When you add those statements up together, I can't see how, I can't see how it's possible to conclude that Israel has launched anything except a war of genocide against the people of Gaza. Okay, so I'd like to respond to that. First of all, Israel does provide warnings. It urged the Gazan population to move to the south part of the Strip before it ended up being, they, they, they delayed a ground invasion. So there were efforts to try to, to warn the civilian population to get out of the way of the war. So I would join you in saying that what, I, what the President Herzog said, um, perhaps he was still furious after this diabolical atrocity from Hamas. Um, but it was inappropriate, and uh, I disagree with it, and Palestinians are not responsible for Hamas. I have said that consistently since this war began and since before this war began. So you get no argument from me that that rhetoric was wrong. However, the actions of Israel clearly show that this is not the case. And I might add that Israel provides about 10% of the water for Gaza. The rest of it I don't know the statistic of 97% of the groundwater is not potable. You can find it right now. Okay, Just well, very good. You can, uh, Nicole can look up. Let, okay. let, but uh, I want to I continue here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we also know that Hamas has massive stocks of fuel and water and food and everything else in their tunnels, which they do not share with the regular population. We also know that the leaders, I might add, of Hamas, uh, who are celebrating this uh, operation, uh, killing 1,400 at least uh, Israelis, uh, and uh, other foreign nationals, and, the, and not to mention the abductions and so forth, which, by the way, is also a war crime, that they live in Doha and five-star hotels. So I say to you that, yes, some of this rhetoric was wrong, but I don't think it is indicative of a particular plan. For you to use a word like, it is a genocide, is, um, again, uh, a what, typical you, kind of Finkelsteinian flourish. No, it's not a Finkelsteinian flourish. It is. You're not. Excuse you're me, just. You're, Mr. Eli. Eli. Mr. You Blake. said. You said you've read. It's Mr. Lake to you. you you've read. <laughs> you've read. You said you've read my books. Not all of them. I've read. Uh, I've written about twelve books. Now, apart from the books I've written on the Nazi Holocaust, I don't think, if you, brought a magnifying glass, a microscope, to my books, you'll ever see the word genocide. In fact, except... You just said genocide. Uh, no, no I said before this moment. He's going to tell us why it's appropriate now where he's never... I never... I'm not cavalier with language. I take great pride 
in my mastery of my, the English language, and in the precision in my use of it. Mm. I said, in this instance, in this instance, when I add up the statements, and I was looking carefully at Perio, the other person, yes, I was, because there are other people who have their, ID, their feet are dug in. And I was watching your face, Perio for the listeners, she's a member of the staff here. And I was watching your face, how you process the information that I just provided and which nobody disputes. Galant I said, just gave you more well, information no, 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 in context. No. Galant, Galant. They, by the way, they allow defense, now the water and the defense, electricity. What are you talking yeah, They allow allow, humanitarian they allow, barter yeah. now. Listen, there's a difference between what was the announced okay. plan of the government of Israel on October 8th and the pressures. As they were counting and, their debt. As, and, now, and the pressures that are now being exerted. Okay. But let's look at the reality. But, but I, I, got, I want to say, right we, we now, have to move on to something. Right now, I, 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 I'm I, sorry, I want, hold, 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 I want I to respond right to you. Guys. Right now, 2%, 2% of the truckloads of food that are needed for Gaza, based on past experience, 2% are being admitted. Right now, all the human rights organizations are saying, all of them, there's a crisis in the fuel, which means the hospitals are going to be, not be able to function. They're going to become dysfunctional. This is, if you look at the details, and then you look at okay. what they said okay. on October okay. 8th, Wait. and you put the two together. Now, you say it okay, Mr. Like we, we, we got We got allowed to move but on. I would, like, I would like your listeners to remember, Lesson. more children were killed in Gaza in the last three weeks than all the other war zones in the world combined okay. in the years 2020, 2021, 2022. That's including a, Ukraine. That's a, right, I don't know. Including okay, okay, Ukraine. Okay, okay, okay. That's sir, a pretty sir, horrible thing. Right, wait, okay. hold on. So you, 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 I want to say, quickly say, respond I'm going to let you respond. I just want to say one thing. Okay. Uh, I don't mean to. I don't mean to be cavalier by trying to cut you off about mm -hmm. that because I only did it because it's something we've said already. And I just want to. Mm -hmm. We should all acknowledge, because things can get hot and it can look like we don't. That I believe every person in this room deeply feels the tragedy of children dying. Yes. And this is one of the accusations that goes around, and it's a scurrilous accusation that the people who defend what Israel did are so hard-hearted that they don't break for the children uh, dying. The images are Im impossible to look at. We all know that, and we, I think we all acknowledge that. So go ahead to respond. The tactic that Israel initially tried and then relented on within a week was because this is what you do when somebody has taken this many hostages. Was it over 220 at this point? And they're still trying to figure out the exact numbers. So when you, again, you, there's no other like, factor in your analysis. So why would the Israelis decide that they're going to cut everything out of Gaza? Because they wanted to use it as a pressure tactic to get Hamas to relent. Now, I believe that this was a strategic and tactical mistake of Israel, mainly because Hamas likes dead Palestinians. And so therefore you're not going to get them to give up hostages because you're just going to help them in their war aims. So, of course, the Israelis, I think, were clearly, it was a blow, a major blow to the nation state of Israel, and they made a decision that they then revoked. But, you know, if you think that this is still a genocide, explain to me why they but, relented so, on so, all so, of these so let points. Me, let me add two things to the record because I yeah. looked at the New York Times, it says, as the headlines from two days ago, as Gazans scrounge for food and water, Hamas sits on a rich trove of supplies. Well, no, I know what the Times writes. Ham oh, I want listeners, uh, Hamas has hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel for vehicles and rockets, caches of ammunition, explosive materials to make more, stockpiles of food, water, and medicine, the officials said. The a officials said. A senior Lebanese yeah, official yeah, said Hamas. Yeah, well, okay. The I'm, officials I'm, said. Let enough me enough fighting. To, I want to ask you a question, Noam. I would like you for a moment to 
Well, I, I want to say, I, wait, wait, before, wait, before you interrupt, before you interrupt me, I, I, I'm going to let you, let, I, let, me, let me finish my, let me finish what yeah. I wanted to say. That, that's what the Times said. Uh, yeah. I have no way of, yeah. uh, well, there is a very easy way. But the other thing I, I want like to ask a simple once question. You will, I will, let me yeah. finish, I'll let mm -hmm. you. Okay. The other thing is I wanted to just put in here because, um, again, going back to your Nat Turner thing. Mm -hmm. If you can allow for that kind of rage for these kind of atrocities, and you use the word atrocity, mm -hmm. knowing what the Israeli people at least believe went on, mm -hmm. at least believe can you happened. not allow in some way for intemperate statements? Does, does, your, does, your, does your solicitousness to psychology make you so uh, solicitous to Hamas psychology, and then on the day after these atrocities, said, he said something yeah, harsh. Boy, but no that, that to me seems a, a lack of fairness. No, no, when you say a lack of fairness, I have to be attentive to that statement because it seems to me you're using a moral standard and I have to respect that. You don't say things like, you know, they're just all animals or they're all legitimate targets. You say to me, Okay, fairness. But I Nobody think said we haven't seen anything in the record. Yeah, they're yeah. all animals. But, but go ahead. But, go ahead. But no, Nobody has said they're but all. No, I said Hamas. Was you, you're missing a point. It's three weeks later, and that tactic is being pursued. No, it's not. That, that's a different you, point. You, you you brought up Herzog's you, remark. You, you said I, I quoted the three. But you quoted without anything, anything, October nothing 8th. about you said yourself. But I understand. I can I can make yeah, some well, allowance because right. this was the worst day for Jews since the right. Holocaust. Right. I can understand his psychology. Right. I'm saying if you're going to understand okay. people's psychology, let's understand people's oh, psychology. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Let Let's say you know. Let's say. They were driven mad by what happened. And when people ask me, why is Israel in, uh, afflicting this genocide in Gaza? I say, number one, I have no doubt it's just bloodlust revenge. You know, I'm, I'm not going to dispute that. Number two, it's what Israel calls restoring its deterrence capacity. Because it suffered in October. Uh, we're going to start chopping it up more fondly, only because we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. I hope you think I'm being fair to you so right. far. I, I have no quarrel. Okay, because I'm, I'm trying to be very fair. Go the ahead. war aim is to remove Gaza, Hamas from Gaza. That is what the war aim is. So I would have put it to you, Norman Finkelstein. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is a legitimate war aim? Well... Let's do two things. Number one, let's clarify what we mean by Hamas. You say you want to remove Hamas yes. from Gaza. Now, I can cite a half dozen statements, and in fact, at the end, if you want, I could provide you with a half dozen statements or more by Israeli officials saying, let's use this opportunity uh -oh. to get rid of the population of Gaza. That's Hamas. Hamas, for your listeners, you should bear in mind. Hamas means, when Israel says get rid of Hamas, it means the 2.3 million people of Gaza. No, it doesn't. It wants to clear up what it calls, clear out the northern sector, which means among the most densely populated places on God's earth, they want to take half the population, namely what's called the northern sector, and push them into the south. So now among the most densely populated places on God's earth is going to be doubly, doubly densely populated. Why do they want to do that? To force Egypt to open the Rafa gate. They've said it over and over again. They want to, to force them want to, into Sinai. They said they want to, to, get, to get rid of them, force them into the Sinai. So Hamas means a mass ethnic cleansing. That's what it means when you say Hamas. No, it doesn't. Now, okay, let, let, let him answer. Let him answer. Go ahead. Okay. okay. You can come back to it. But I, I, haven't, I want to ask another question, but go ahead, Eli. Mm -hmm. I think what Israel is trying to do is to remove an organization that just committed a mass slaughter and treats its own population as PR pawns. And if it is true, and we still have to wait for some of this reporting to bear out, that Iran had a role in this, then that is even more cynical. 
when Israel asked for the population in northern Gaza to go to the south, it was because they were trying to avoid civilian casualties. That's what a humane military does, and that's what Israel did, even in its rage. Now, I'm sorry that you were incapable of using Occam's razor that would just tell you, hey, we were just attacked by these disgusting terrorists, and we have to eliminate this terrorist organization so it no longer rules Gaza. I think anybody looking at this who isn't familiar with much of anything and just sort of casually pays attention to the news can understand that. But you, again, have twisted all of this and said, no, 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 it's ethnic cleansing. So the victims of this horrendous massacre, in an effort to defend themselves, but their defense is illegitimate because I think the, 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 tr the tragedy of your position, Norman Finkelstein, is that you actually don't understand that Hamas brings nothing but misery to the Palestinians. If you were a true friend of the Palestinians, you would be calling for regime change in Gaza at the top of your lungs, but you're not. And you are more interested in demonizing Israel and delegitimizing any response that Israel might have to this horrific massacre. And you're holding Israel to this standard that no other country could possibly be held to. Okay, okay. I want to change the subject. Okay. So the, the current conflict, you know, the, 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 um, the whole Arab-Israeli conflict has shades of a Palestinian nationalist cause, a greater Arab cause, and a global jihad. And this, this becomes uh, confusing to know which part of the conflict we're talking about. And I noticed in, in the 1988 Hamas charter said, the question of the liberation of Palestine is bound to three circles, the Palestinian circle, the Arab circle, and the Islamic circle. Each of these circles has its role in the struggle against Zionism. Each has its duties, and it is a horrible mistake and it's a sign of deep ignorance to overlook any of these circles. Since this is the case, liberation of Palestine is then an individual duty for every Muslim, wherever he may be. On this basis, the problem should be viewed. This should be realized by every Muslim. So are we seeing a fight for the Palestinians for a homeland? Or are we seeing jihad on a global basis? Are we seeing the Arabs uh, um, intransigence a la 1948 that they don't want a Jewish state? Or are we seeing the Arab street uh, just advocating for the cause of the Palestinian people? How do, you, how do you untangle those intertwined threads? Again, that Hamas itself speaks about. How do you see it? He's laughing well, already at me. I'm, <laughs> not I'm not laughing. I'm not laughing. Good. Okay. Yeah, I thought I, I'm not. I don't mean that badly. I, you know, I, I thought I said something. You know. It's a funny thing. <laughs> I go back a long ways, yeah. much longer than anyone here. I remember the days in order to discredit the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, in order to discredit it, when the Palestinian Liberation Organization was doing everything in its can it could to get a two-state settlement based on international law. They always read from the charter. Now, the Palestine Liberation Organization Charter. Now, Palestinians, the PLO, they never cited the charter. It was ancient history covered in cobwebs. They wanted that Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza with its capital in East Jerusalem. But they do talk now, like jihadis. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now, they don't need the charter. Been, I just happened to they find have, the charter. We have plenty be, of video of them right, talking like jihadis, they're, and Iran right, is jihad. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of literature on that. Hamas charter. Well, leave no, the charter aside. Okay, okay, so. Let's just take the evidence of jihad. Okay, when it, okay. I, I'll take the evidence. Okay. The evidence is, if you look at the record, beginning in 2006, Hamas was looking for a settlement with Israel. Sometimes they called it, sometimes they called it, Eli, you can laugh, but laughter can also be an, an indication of ignorance. Mm. So. There's, I run a comedy club, right. so I hope, I hope not, but go ahead. Right. <laughs> so um, beginning in 2006, there were many attempts made by Hamas to reach a settlement of the conflict. Now, sometimes they called it the Arabic term for a, a long-term truce, a 30-year truce. Other times, they talked about a settlement of the conflict. Israel did not want to settle the conflict with Hamas or, for that matter, to settle the conflict with the PLO. Exactly why time doesn't allow me to go into that. But it's never wanted a settlement. 
But let's just fast forward. Ba- Barack didn't want a settlement? Excuse me? Barack, Ehud Barack well, it, didn't want a settlement? It, it, depends, it depends on what you mean by a settlement. When I use the word settlement, I mean settlement based on the principles of international law. I don't think the principles are great, but nonetheless, that was the consensus of the international community. If you're interested, and I would point to your listeners, every year, every year, the UN General Assembly votes on a resolution called Peaceful Settlement of the the, uh, Palestine Question. And every year, the whole world votes on one side, namely the terms that are spelled out, Israel, the United States, and some Pacific atolls, Tuvalu, Palu, Tonga, together with the U.S. and Israel, vote against it. That record cannot be easily effaced because it's been every year since maybe 2000. That's what the that's what the record shows. But let's how look, many of the okay, let, go, let, let, okay. let him answer. We, well, we, allow me. Just, we just got to we got to dice it. Right. Just let me, no, no, finish let me oh, okay. Go ahead. Let me fast forward to the present, please. Um, you talk about is it global jihadi? Is it pal? Is it for a Palestinian state? Uh, I don't think, with all due regard to you, I don't think it's very complicated what happened. The Palestine question had vanished from the international agenda. I myself, and I've freely admitted it in interviews, beginning in 2020, I gave up. After 40 years of devoting myself and my entire adult life to chronicling what happened in Gaza, I gave up. And so the people there, they saw that the international community had itself given up on Gaza and given up on the Palestinians. So does it require a knowledge of whether it's global jihadi, a Palestinian state, an Islamic state, or to use Eli Lake's expression, let's apply Akham's razor. Akham razor, for those of you who don't know, it's simple. Per- tell for Periel. Yeah, it, no, for everyone. <laughs> it just means sometimes... The simplest explanation, or the most obvious explanation, is the right explanation. I think the simplest explanation and the right explanation is 2.3 million people were holed up in the concentration camp with no hope in the future, none. Even Norman G. Finkelstein from Brooklyn, New York, who gave over his entire adult life to trying to get fairness for the Palestinians, had given up. And so they decided on October 7th to take their fate into their own hands and come what may. This is their way to, to, to intrude on the, on the world's agenda and that's, remind everybody. That's exactly when, okay, so that's exactly when Nat Turner said, Okay. Matt Turner said, I want to cause a national crisis over slavery. I mean, That's why I'm I, doing this. To, to be honest, I, I mean, there has to be some reason they did it. That's as good as any. Go ahead. I look at Occam's Razor, and I see that an organization that in its charter, in its weekly calls to prayer and, 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 and sermons in mosques, in its literature, in its children's program, glorifies and calls for the killing of Jews— And on October 7th, that's exactly what they did. Now, you may think that this is a way of getting the world to pay attention and that this will lead to a two-state solution. But this is actually starting a war with a more powerful party for which there is no preparation to try to save lives or to protect their own population. It is an incredibly destructive act. It is not a democratic act. It is an act of sacrifice. It is what a death cult does. So you may think that this is explained. I mean, you originally told us it was the rage built up over the years and this, I mean, and you this slur that you call it a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And then you say, no, 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 no. They want to put it on the international agenda. Maybe maybe next we'll tell us that it's about Al-Aqsa Mosque. Who knows? 
I think it's because it's an organization dedicated to killing Jews, and that's what they did. But do you think they had any strategy, or is this just visceral uh, well, I, pleasure? Well, I have to say, I am still thinking that the verdict is out. But if Iran had a role in planning or training in any way for this, and that this was in the interest of Iran, then I could then I think it is totally likely that Hamas decided to launch this suicide mission to advance Iran's strategic agenda. Once again, like we've seen throughout the history of the Palestinian uh, struggle for an independent state, they have been co-opted by other regional powers. And in that case, again, if you care about Palestinians, you have to favor regime change in Gaza. Mr. Finkelstein, let me ask you this, and I have another question. Uh, and I'm asking this sincerely. When These are smart people, right? So when they uh, attack Israel this way, mm-hmm. they understand there's going to be a reaction, and they understand that reaction is going to mean thousands of people are dead. So in some way, that has to be part of their intention. Mm-hmm. Is that part of... Uh, are they, in a sense, going, using these three th- these thousands of people dead as weapons in their struggle? I'm going to, you know, uh, inhabit the, the psychology that you're describing in their struggle to make the world the world grapple with their cause, and the only way to do that is by showing them dying. Because if it shows them, you know going about their business every day, how do you get people to be urgent about that? So is the death part of the strategy here? Like murder by suicide, you know, they say that, uh, uh, murder by cop, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Is this murder by, uh, suicide, suicide by cop, sorry, you know, you know what I'm talking about. There are many questions interwoven into that question. So let me just uh, try to address several of them. Number one, I haven't a clue what was the reasoning behind what uh, Hamas chose to do on October 7th. I was speaking to the motivation of the 1,500 to 2,000. I guess it's closer to 2,000 because Israel said it killed 1,500 Hamas militants. And you assume that there are about 290, the figure is now, hostages. So you assume about 500 Hamas fighters went back with the hostages. So you're talking about 2,000 young men uh, who burst through the gates. And I was talking about what in my mind, and I admit, as I said in what I wrote, it it sounds like a bad B-script movie, what was going through their heads. Uh, Now, so I can't say what they intended to do. I don't know, and frankly, I don't think anybody does except a handful of people in Hamas, because apparently most of the organization didn't know that was going to happen on October 7th. Number two, you can never, you can never, allow me. Okay, go ahead. You can never figure out exactly what the consequences are going to be in the long term. So let me give you an example. Now Turner Rebellion, what's the consequence? Well, 120 blacks were killed. The whites in the South went on a rampage, beheaded the black people randomly, randomly. Uh, beheaded them, put them on pole, you know, put their heads on poles to warn the other black slaves, don't do that, okay? So, and then the laws were severely tightened. Actually, as a result of Nat Turner's rebellion, that's when they passed the law that black people can't learn to read because uh, Nat Turner was hyper-literate. So the immediate result was very negative. But then Nat Turner inspires John Brown. John Brown says, I was inspired by Nat Turner. And then if you read Frederick Douglass, the great black abolitionist, he says that there was, connect the dots, you go from uh, John Brown to the Civil War. There's a direct link. So I say, you can never say with certainty what will be the result. What did seem certain was, and this I hope your listeners will take in, by 2023, October 6th, the people of Gaza were being left to languish and die. 
That I could say with 100% certainty. And do you know why? Because I left them to languish and die also. When you say die, you mean? Meaning no past, no present, no future, except to pace that perimeter of Gaza. There was nothing, nothing for them except to languish. So that's number two. Number three, number three. If we were to take the question of consequences. Now, bear in mind, I'm speaking now as the son of two people who were in the Warsaw Ghetto. It's very easy to make the argument, what did the Jewish fighting organization accomplish? All it accomplished, if you want to make this argument, all it accomplished was it accelerated the destruction of the ghetto and the deportation of the 20 to 40,000 survivors to Majdanek concentration camp. You can make that argument. Now, here's the interesting right, thing. I, I, wait, 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 nobody, nobody makes that argument. Nobody says, well, rationally speaking, I, I, I will, the uprising was very dumb. I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow up on your argument. Let me ask you this question: is, I, I, You're just you, you. This is like three different ways to say Israel are the Nazis, and it's as I said earlier, historically illiterate. It does. It, the analogy is nonsense. I, I, I didn't, and I'm not going to let it stand. I'm sorry, but like, if you're going to do this and you're going to you're going to try to appeal to like, well, we wouldn't say this about the Warsaw Partisans. He, he did. You know. He did make that analogy, but I took I took okay. a, another meaning there okay. too. Let me ask you this question: Would because I'd had a, a, a thought, not your thought, but a, a a cousin of that thought, which is that uh, uh, polities sometimes the pendulum swings to the other side of whatever was the side when something terrible like this happened. So Israel swung to the right during the Second Intifada. Would it shock you that now Israel now swings somewhat to the left, saying, listen, you got us into this mess. The right, you right-wing guys, obviously this is not working. And would it shock you that then, that from this sprouted, a renewed uh, attention to the peace process. Not a different argument whether the end justifies the means, but would it shock you if that happens? Which is, I, I think, think, sort of what I you're think. Saying. If 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 Israel can remove Hamas from Gaza, and there is a credible plan, hopefully one with elections, and more responsible parties are elected, yes, you could have a peace process. So eventually, in, in response to what, the, the but you did. cannot have a peace process when these fanatic, Jew-hating fascists are in charge. And the reason why, and listen, you 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 consistently overstate this blockade. You use these out of control analogies and so forth. But the reason why there are border controls for Gaza is because Hamas uses Gaza as a military staging platforms, whether it's rockets tunnels or power gliders, whatever it is. So that's why Israel has to make sure that everything that goes into Gaza, and they obviously didn't do a very good job because a lot of these guys who went and shot up a concert full of you know young peaceniks were wearing bulletproof vests and had pretty modern weaponry. You know, so in that respect, Norman Finkelstein, I, as I said, if you want a two-state solution, and I certainly do, then you have to deal with the fact that I'll Hamas is a cancer that must be removed. E e Eli, and and Eli, don't tell me that Hamas is really all the Palestinians, because okay. that's not true e either. E Eli, I never said that. What did you never I say? Said, I said, Herzog said, all of the Palestinians in Gaza are Hamas. I didn't say that, Eli. I'm quoting You said the what president. Israel means when they say yeah. get rid of Hamas. Okay. And then I okay. said, well, then here's, look at what Israel did. Question. Look at what Israel yeah, did, and know, it discredits an your argument that here, that was the policy. Here's an interesting question. Okay. Here's an interesting question. Eli says that they can't let people in because of security reasons. But here's the interesting question. Why don't they let them out? They do. There are 40,000 work, work permits work, before October 7th that were given yeah, to Palestinians. I'm talking about Palestinians being able to leave 
leave. They're not allowed even cancer patients, cancer patients who are seeking better, better medical care outside can't leave Gaza. And that brings us to the interesting question, this question of hostages. We're told that Hamas took maybe 290 hostages. Guess what? Israel has kept 2,300,000 hostages in Gaza. The condition being you can't leave until you overthrow Hamas. That's why they're being kept hostage. So I, for one, I, for one, want the Israeli hostages freed, the 290, and I want the 2,300,000 Gaza hostages freed. What Mr. the head of the current head of the South African government, the president of South Africa, he said we need an immediate ceasefire, we need the 290, he didn't give the figure, but the hostages freed. And then he said, and the blockade of Gaza has to be lifted. That blockade is holding 2,300,000 people hostage, half of whom 1,150,000 are children. I, 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 look, I, I have to respond to that. Why is there restrictions because it's not an entire blockade and there are cancer patients that can get treatment elsewhere and there are also these 40,000 work permits which were granted and before hand and we know now from Israeli reporting that one of the reasons why they were able to know where to go in these kibbutzim is because the Gazans working in these kibbutz were who, who were allowed to go over there were uh, in the end informing I guess Hamas into you know how to how to commit their mass Actually, murder. I think that's probably true. Okay so why would there be these restrictions? Well, I think it's because Hamas runs Gaza and they want to kill Jews. Because Maybe that's it. Israel has made it clear. There's no mystery. But I, th they can't well, leave until, why, they over, until they overthrow I, Hamas. I, I got to say two things. First of all, uh, on that point that he's making, I ha had the same thought that some of the horrible, I put horrible in scare quotes, uh, actions that, the Israel, that Israel does vis-a-vis -vis checkpoints, vis-a-vis... Uh, surveillance, uh, uh, questioning, all this stuff of the Palestinians, which looks so terrible to us. When we see what Hamas did, we realize, oh, maybe if not for these things that Israel does, this kind of thing would have happened sooner. There is a relationship right. and between... Maybe, and maybe if there wasn't a blockade of Gaza... And people can live a normal yes, maybe, life. Maybe, but I'm just saying. And maybe they could live a normal life. It wouldn't have happened in the first place. Maybe, but I'm making a different yeah. point. Now, now, as far as Herzog's speech, I'm happy mm -hmm. I looked it up. It said, it's an entire nation out there that is responsible. Herzog mm -hmm. said at a press conference. Then a um, uh, reporter asked to clarify. He said, that makes them by implication. No. Uh, Read the says, first sentences. It is an entire nation out there that is responsible, Herzog said at a press conference. It is not true, this rhetoric about civilians not being aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true. They could have risen up. They could have fought against that evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. When a reporter asked Herzog to clarify did that, uh, he, whether he meant to say since Gazans did not remove Hamas power, that makes them by implication legitimate targets, he says, no, I didn't say that. But then he stated, when you have a missile in your goddamn kitchen and you want to shoot it at me, am I allowed to defend myself? So this is typical of the kind of spinning it in one way. I don't know. I'd have I to think about exactly, it. What, I know exactly what he said. Right, but you didn't said say that's no, what he said. He said there's no distinction between Hamas and the civilian population. But he, he didn't say there were legitimate said, targets. Yeah, As a matter of fact, he, he yeah, said, yeah, no, that's and, not what I meant. Then, and what is the inference from that? What is the inference? If you say... If you say, I'll, I'll turn to uh, a neutral person. Perry. Ariel, oh, she's yeah. the worst. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if, if you say, if you say, Come here, Perry. there's no distinction. Don't mess it up. There's no distinction between Hamas and the civilian population because they elected Hamas 
and they are responsible for Hamas. Yes, that is the so, inference. So what is the inference? That is the inference. Yeah. But if three three yeah, minutes because, later somebody says, did you mean that? I says, no, I didn't mean yeah, that. Because he then, realized he realized there was a problem here. Maybe. He or, or, maybe, maybe or, or maybe he spoke yeah, inartfully. Yeah, right. May, why, we've all, may, may, oh, I don't think. Why it was tell so, them that they, they listen? Evacuate you, you, where hold on, have... you can be right, mm -hmm. but I would say it's not fair not to mention to somebody. Mm -hmm. Listen, they did ask him, and he did say that's not what he meant, but I don't believe it. But to tell people that's what he said, said and, le and leave out the yeah, fact what, that he said otherwise, what, what, I don't think is is, yeah, is, what, what is, I scholar said was, is scholarship. What I said was, they announced their plan on October eighth, and then I said. They proceeded for the last three weeks to act on that plan. They if you changed their if, plan that too, yeah. times in if you weeks. if you follow anything, anything that's gone on in the last three weeks, I told I said twenty five miles by five miles. In the first week, they dropped more bombs on Gaza than any year during the war in Afghanistan. I have a question about so that. I, Wait, I have I a ask, question about that. Yeah. If that bombing was indiscriminate, mm -hmm. would it be only 5,000 casualties? Seems to me if you drop that right. number of bombs on the d most right. densely populated place right. pla indiscriminately, mm -hmm. you would kill tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. I will, I never s speak when I'm not knowledgeable. I'm telling you, I, do that. I, I don't. It works for me. I'm, well, <laughs> okay. I don't go for that. <laughs> go ahead. It's not my style. I'm giving you the facts. Yeah. It's not disputed that, number one, more bombs were dropped on Gaza than on Afghanistan in every year of the war of, in Afghanistan, bearing in mind the size of Gaza as compared to the size of Afghanistan. Number two, the Times reported, not that they attach any significance to the Times, the Times reported this has been the most, among the most dense bombings since in the 21st century. Among the most densest bombings in the 21st century. Okay? Now, you, you remember, remember my question, yeah, right? My question I was, can, wouldn't you see way I, more I can, casualties? I, I would say 10,000 isn't bad. I would say you're doing good. I would also the say most densely right, populated on right, God's earth, right, indiscriminate bombing, right. more bombings than well, we've seen in all of wait, Afghanistan, wait, 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 and you killed just a okay. few thousand people. Uh, well, wait one second. You say just a few thousand people. I think I cited the statistic that more children were killed in Af in Gaza yes. in three weeks than. All the other war zones in the world combined. But most people in Gaza are children. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So that's what you'd expect. You'd expect 50% of everybody killed in Gaza know, to be children. I'm saying, I'm saying. You want to say something? I have a question. Okay, can okay. you ask a question? Yeah. Dan Natterman, I'm a senior here at uh, City University. Uh, <laughs> that's usually what I hear when I watch it. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, you mentioned that uh, Gaza, no one's allowed out of Gaza. Mm -hmm. um, Gaza, go ahead. Gaza. Um, now, the Egyptian border also has a, a policy that they don't let Gazans into Egypt. Uh, does does Israel forbid uh, if if Gaza if if Egypt opened up the border, would Israel uh, allow that, or at least before October seventh, would Israel allow Gazans to go to Egypt and maybe even go overseas from Egypt? If if Egypt allowed that, would Israel allow? I think they'd like that now. If, okay. I, I think Professor Finkelstein would say they would like that now because if their strategy is to get them out of Gaza, then... I think, you know, I've had uh, differences of opinion with friends over this. It is a complicated question. On the one hand, as a humanitarian, sheer humanitarian gesture, should you open up the border? Should Egypt open up the border of? Gaza and let the people out. On the other hand, not that I would make any apologies for uh, the mass murderer uh, of Egypt, the head of state, Mr. Sisi, but he has a problem. The problem is that our Secretary of State Blinken, Anthony Blinken, and the U.S. administration in general, and Israel, and Israel, 
have been applying huge pressure on Egypt to let the people go into, into Egypt. And then he says, I'm not going to facilitate, I am not going to abet the ethnic cleansing of Gazans into Egypt. I don't want to be part of that. And then what do you say to that? Well, I looked around for what people were saying. I think the obvious answer is, don't force them to flee. There should be a ceasefire now. So they don't have to flee. Let's end with that's that. Their, that's their home. And I want people to bear in mind, 70% are refugees from 48, from 1948 when Israel was created. They have lived since 1948 in refugee camps in Gaza, 70%. And now Israel wants to turn them into refugees twice over to dispatch them into the Sinai desert to rot and die. Because of one thing you can be certain, CC, President CC of Egypt, will never let them assimilate into Egyptian society. That's never going to happen. So now you want to take the refugees from 1948 who are living in the refugee camps in Gaza and make them refugees again. That's the U.S. plan. Okay. And now Israel is saying, we're, because Egypt is now facing a huge economic crisis, and Israel is saying, we will get the IMF to release money to you, because right now one half of their revenues are being used to service the debt. We will give you money and you let the refugees in there. Now I ask you, is that not hostage taking? Okay. Is that not hostage taking Professor, to want to expel them? No, first of all, a no, second time, where are you getting expel this them a second time now into the Sinai desert? Is that not well, hostage-taking? Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so you're referring to a report in Haaretz where one person suggested expelling Gazans to these one? tents. One? Yes, it was one, one recommendation of many things. You seem I'm to think that Israel has a master plan that it concocted uh, Eli, literally 24 read. hours Eli, after this Eli, horrible Eli, massacre, Eli, which it keeps changing. Eli, so it's, in, it's incredible. Eli, yes, I'm, you really don't have a clue what you're talking about. I respect maybe you're busy with other areas. You're referring to one document that was an intelligence organization. It was from October 13th, and they talked about the possibility of an expulsion. There have been so many statements now issued by Israelis saying this is a great opportunity to resolve the Gaza question by expelling the Gazans. It's Wh not where? one who, person. Who, who, who's I, saying I, that? I, I'm going to do something. Okay, Eli, Eli I, I think okay, we, we, but, but we, I don't want to get caught up on this because I think what you are saying is another I just fantasy told you, from yeah, you. Fantasy. Because fact, the Israelis left Gaza in 2005. It, 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 they have tried to get some sense where okay. if you are a civilian, get out of the way. We want to have a war to destroy Eli, Hamas. Eli. I, think, I think the answer is more complicated than that, in my opinion, because, um, and, and demography is not our friend here. We both, I think, agree that there is a growing hard right I agree. in Israel so who, who is hey, now in, right. and And it would not shock me that some of okay, them ben Gavir, think this way. But there's and, a unity government now. We yeah, yeah, say that. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah, a and, unity and, government. Yes. Yeah. And I would agree, if you want to say that these that Ben Gavir and Schmotrick are Judeo fascists, I've said that about them before. I 100% He has. Agree. I heard him say that. But yeah. um, so I'm not going to argue that those people have terrible ideas and they do want to expel. But that so far, Israel hasn't done that. What Israel did do is it left Gaza. And I just think that you are ignoring the fact that it tried to say... Get out of the northern part of this Gaza because we have to go after these demons who are in the tunnels. Right. Get out of the hospitals. Come uh, on. I want to end with the ceasefire issue. Okay. So okay. that's why I, 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 I want to just, oh. I, I'm just a strictly factual question. Yeah. yeah. Israel did not leave Gaza in 2005. Israel redeployed its troops from inside Gaza to the perimeter of Gaza. Even Israel's leading expert on international law, 
Yoram Dinstein, the former president of Tel Aviv University, even he acknowledged that after Israel redeployed its troops, Gaza was still under Israeli occupation. There is no human rights organization, even including Yoram Dinstein, who's quite conservative, who denies that if you control everything that goes in, you control everything that goes out, you control the airspace, you control the waters, you're the occupying power in that well, area. Of course, but the question is leaving out the settlements that they also uprooted. Yeah, they uprooted yeah. the And they left yeah. and they left greenhouses and they left. Okay, okay let's the, start the, the heart, fairy tales. The heart of the, the heart of the matter. They didn't leave the greenhouses? Mm -hmm. The heart oh, of the matter has by... to be why. Why do they feel it necessary to do this? Why they don't they, they they're harsh with the West Bank, but that's not the policy on the West Bank. So we'll have to leave that to another day. Why do they feel that they can't take any mm -hmm. chances with this particular part of uh, of, of geography, but it's my final question. So yes. I just remember. Um, By the way, just on the West Bank, yeah. Haggai El Ad, who's the, uh, who's the executive time. director of Beth Selim, he has in the current issue of the New Yorker an article called "Quote: The Gazification of the West Bank." We don't read the New Yorker because they were unfair to Hassan Minhaj. Okay, okay. so uh, I'm kidding. So uh, uh, I remember when the Gulf War started, and I, mm -hmm. I was a supporter of the Iraq War. Um, I remember saying to my father, because there was all sorts of talk going back and forth, I remember saying, I sure hope they know what they're doing. And they didn't, right? And we've seen this in many, many wars, without regard to the justification of them, that they backfire. It's happened to Israel as well. What is your sense for the wisdom of the military action, or is that maybe we just don't have enough facts, but what's your sense for it? Why would you oppose a ceasefire now? All those, that bundle of issues. You have, you have thoughts on all that? And then we'll let you end. I'm, and then we'll I'm, I'm not a military planner. There are great hazards in urban warfare. Uh, I think we have to mourn the civilian casualties, which are inevitable in this kind of fighting. And, um, I mean, again, I don't have access to the intelligence or anything like that. Well, However, I fully endorse the goal of dismantling this organization and just killing their leaders wherever they are so that they can no longer hold Gaza hostage, which is what they are doing, and can no longer commit mass pogroms against the Jewish Let people. me add a log on that fire that just came out a couple of days ago. Okay. Uh, Gallup had a poll of uh, uh, Palestinian support for the two-state solution, and it's down to 16% of people 25 and under. It's much higher as, as you get older and older, which um, I don't know if that shows Israeli policy is backfiring or, or if uh, pa Palestinian policy is succeeding, but that's, that's the people of tomorrow that are going to be making these decisions. It's very, it, it's, it's, it's very I think upsetting. You, have to, you cannot talk about any kind of two-state solution. You can't talk about any of that until you get rid of Hamas. And I would put the question to you, do you support the dismantling of Hamas? Good question. Okay. Number, I'll, you, I'll answer that question because I never shy away from questions as long as I've thought them through. And then number two, what should be done now? So, let's take a simple case. About f uh, 1,400 people, according to Israeli figures, about 1,400 people were killed on October 7th of those, about 350 were soldiers. If you look at the figures for, let's say, Operation Cast, uh, Operation Cast Lead, it's about the same. 1,400 people killed in Operation Cast Lead, about a quarter of them Hamas militants. It's so roughly the same. So if you are of the opinion that because of what Hamas did on October 7th, it has to be destroyed, not just dismantled, it has to be destroyed. That, by the way, is Bernie Sanders' position. I acknowledge that. Then, by that reasoning, the Israeli government has to be dismantled and destroyed. Now, that's just one massacre. See, that's just one. Because Israel likes to periodically mow the lawn. In Operation Protect... I thought you were going to answer the okay, question. Okay, I'm answering the question. 
I'm saying if Hamas has to be dismantled because of what it did in October 7th, then if you take Operation Cast Lead, Operation Pillar of Defense, Operation Protective Edge, then the Israeli government has to be dismantled 10 times yeah, I over. I follow you, but it's not really an answer to the oh, question. Oh, it is an answer to the no, question. Because it's called keeping a single standard. No, it's you not. Want to no, talk you, about, could... you want to talk about the 290 Israeli hostages? I say fine. But then let's talk about the 2,300,000 Gazan hostages. hostages. Gaza. Oh, yes, Gaza. Hamas is closing the gates. I know that. Gaza's close. Hamas is. Love to open uh, the yeah, to kill okay. more Jews. Yes. Okay. I don't and, think it's and now, the and, I understand. I understand I, your point of hypocrisy. Saying, I'm saying, but it no, still doesn't whether you I think Hamas hold should be everyone to a single standard. Number two, should both governments? Or, what, what do you mean, Israeli? What do you mean by dismantling the Israeli you, government? If you, election? Want to, if you want to decide that Hamas has to be dismantled because of what it did on October seventh. I say, fine, but then the Israeli government has to also be dismantled because for 20 years, it's kept the whole population confined but in a concentration but I don't camp understand it. and periodically, yeah, I, I okay. get you. And periodically mows professor. the lawn. Okay, it professor, mows the lawn. professor, yeah. but... No, you can... You want to destroy me, the world's I'll, only let Jewish me, state. Let me respond. Let me you, ask you a you, question. Hold you, on. You, Just hold on you for a second. You want to mock... Now, maybe... I'm not going to mock you. May, I will maybe, mock you. Maybe... Let me, your, let me, your let me say, comedy, let me comedy give, may be Now you're your, getting personal. Let me just get comedy, my answer. Comedy may be your forte, but the suffering of humanity has been what I've been about since I came onto this earth. Now let me... And I am not... Are you going to let me answer? I am not going to trivialize the fact that 1,100,000 children in Gaza are now the object of a genocide. I see no humor in okay, that. Okay, hold on a second. Nothing hold on a second. funny hold on about a second. that. I would betray the memory of my parents were I ever to mock, ridicule, find funny, whatever. Hold on a second. being done Professor. to those people in Gaza. Professor. It is a crime that makes your heart just scream professor of what's being done to no one is mocked the Hold culprit on. no one is mocked no one has made a joke i'm trying to ask you a question in response to your question what i see is israel is a democracy and there is no substitute for democracy so hopefully the the voters of israel if they are if if they are moved by the the facts that emerge will dismantle, which is not really the right word, but will vote out of office the people they refer, and, and adopt a different policy. Hamas is a military dictatorship. You can't ask them to vote them out. They were so, they, never so, given, so your answer fails. They, they never were D given a chance. The people ah, of it can, uh, the it can people only of be dismantled. Okay, the people it can't of be, it can't be the voted people out of, of office. Gaza and the West Bank were told by our government. Why did you talk, go off on a thing about mocking and joking about the children? I didn't say anything like that. Because I see a kind of lightheartedness. No, you have, you're you, imagining okay, that. Okay, fair enough. If you say I'm, I'm not mocking if you, you, if you say, I pity if you. If you. Say, if you say I'm wrong, then I'll acknowledge okay. I'm wrong. You are okay. wrong. Okay. Uh, I'll acknowledge you. I have no problem with saying that. Okay. Okay. But I, I, I said... The government was never given a chance oh. from the moment it was elected in an election that the U.S. forced on the people of the West Bank in Gaza. And then Jimmy Carter went over to monitor the moment they what elected they that government. Them? Yeah, the United States exerted a lot of pressure at the time. So you don't think yeah. Palestinians should vote for their leaders? I Apparently think, not. I do think they should vote Well, then for why them. would you say they forced it on them? Wait, I don't think you're... Okay, I think there's a disconnect here. I said President Bush urged that there be the election yes. in the West Bank and Gaza. The election occurred in two, January 2006. The Hamas, the political party of Hamas, won, the, won, won the legislature. Won, won, the, won the legislature. And then, just at that moment, the U, Israel, then followed by the EU and the U.S., imposed these draconian, this draconian blockade on Gaza. It was never given a chance. 
and then you call it a military dictatorship. I have no problem with saying that, but it was a dictatorship that was the result of never giving the people a chance for another election. Fair enough, but the, my, Who he, didn't the question stand was: for another should, election? Who? Why isn't there another election? Hamas is not allowed elections. Uh, nor, nor has okay. the the PLO. That's. That's true, too. That's what you okay. must give it. Okay, okay, listen. Mm -hmm. Listen, I think that we've gotten on pretty well here. I think that what we're doing here is a public service of the highest order. I don't think I've seen any conversations uh, like this on any of the major news networks or any place where they should really be had. I hope you haven't had a bad experience here, and I hope that I'm asking you if, if we can do things like this, debates like this, on a somewhat more regular basis basis. If you don't want to come all the way down here, we could do it online, but I think it's much better to do it in, in, in person. Um, we have to wrap it up because I think we're taxing. You, Periel wants to say something. You could say it in Elon's mic. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi. I feel like I've earned the right to speak. Okay, so I have um, a couple of questions for you, and I want to be very clear that I don't think anybody, and God forbid not us, would ever make light of the death of innocent civilians or innocent children, Palestinian or otherwise. That has never, ever been the case here. And my heart and I know everyone who we've spoken to is certainly on that page. So I, I even had a statistician calculate how many 9-11s a thousand Gazan deaths were because it bothered me that Israel was putting everything in terms of 9-11s. And it's, I, I can't remember now. It's like way, if it's one 9-11 for Israel, it's like five 9-11s for God. So as but, a way of people understanding the tragedy of what's going on. So, so I don't think anybody I takes think that 12, 9, as a joke, just to be very clear. Okay. But so you, you said a couple of things that I have questions about. I, I don't think it's fair to characterize Gaza as a concentration camp. And I am the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. My uncle was a child in the camps, and my entire family on my mother's side was murdered by the Nazis. Um, I, I don't think those are, they're, they're not the same thing. I, I'm not saying that Gaza is, um, you know, a, a, a fun place by any stretch of the imagination necessarily, but I don't think that characterizing it as a concentration camp is fair. Um, and then also your point- Would you like me to respond to that sure. first, then you'll go second. Sure. Okay. And you can cut this out uh, if you want. No, no. No, no you're part run. of the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Finkel. So, Baruch Kimmerling was a senior uh, sociologist at the Hebrew University in, in Jerusalem. And he was highly respected. He's since passed from the scene prematurely. If you look at his book, Politicide, I'll spell it for your listeners, P-O-L-I-T-I-C-I-D-E. Hopefully our listeners can spell that themselves. <laughs> yeah, because he coined the term. That's why I'm spelling it for your listeners. He described Gaza as, quote, the largest concentration camp ever that was in the world. That's his expression. Okay. Okay? Number two, he wrote that in 2003. Okay. Before the blockade and before Israel's repeated operations, mowings of the law, lawn in Gaza. I don't like that phrase, but okay. Yeah. It's a revolting phrase, yes. And doesn't that, isn't that something that should give one pause, that that phrase is constantly repeated? We're mowing the lawn in Gaza. Can you imagine the you phrases realize, that Gaza uses you, you about realize, what they've done? Do you realize one million of those blades are children? Okay, I have never heard okay. anyone, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of Israelis, mm -hmm. Hamas is using, sorry, go ahead. ever use that expression. I don't mm -hmm. know anybody who takes any pleasure in killing children. Um, and I, I don't know that that's the standard. But we know that Hamas massacred. You got to talk in the mic. Pleasure. Here, Perry, you can say, come see we know. We know that the Hamas took great pleasure in killing children. Okay, but I'm not, yes, we do, but I'm not talking about that now. I'm talking about the, the Israeli. So I, I don't want to use that phrase as a standard because I think it's repugnant um, on both sides. Um, so that that's one thing. And then you take 
you know, these words like ethnic cleansing and genocide. Um, but I haven't heard you say anything about the horrors of what comes out of Hamas's mouth or these um, maybe maybe it's naive to say that some other people who perhaps are not Hamas apologists or sympathizers who are um, fr from the river to the sea, which calls for the very explicit um, genocide of literally wiping Israel off the map and Jews across the world. Okay. I know we're going to be pressed for time and you obviously are uh, committed to the subject enough that you sat down at the table and you want to ask me questions. And I respect that. Okay, I had a very close friend in Israel. She was like a high school sweetheart. And I was also close with her daughter. And her daughter is the deputy editor of Haaretz. Uh, Tamar Zweigrat, or maybe, yeah, Zweigrat. And on October, she started to hear some of the statements I made. And she was very angry at me. And she said, I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore, and you've lost your moral bearings. And actually, just a week ago, because she was a decent person, I know that, just a week ago, um, when I went to Grand Central Station, and I saw those thousand Jews inside the station, and about 2,000 more outside, the station. I was outside because, silly reason, I don't own a cell phone, and they, and they didn't announce where the demonstration would be until 6 p.m. You had to have a cell phone. So I was stuck at home waiting for my friends to tell me. So I was one of the 2,000 outside. And it was one of the, for me, maybe my chauvinism comes out a little. It was such a proud moment. Such a magnificent moment, seeing 1,000 young Jews inside Grand Central Station wearing ceasefire now on the front of the T-shirt and not in my name on the, out, on the back side of the T-shirt. Uh, it was thrilling. And I wanted to send a picture of that to Tamar and write, I guess it's not just me who's lost his moral bearings. That's not yeah. what I'm asking. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. So now let me get to your question. Uh, my parents were very decent people. They were hardworking. My mother was very educated. She went to Warsaw University, studied mathematics, but that was terminated by the war. That was 1937, okay? Having said that, I once asked my mother, just out of curiosity, so mom, what did you think about the terror bombing of Germany during World War II? They were engaged in terror bombing uh, to kill German civilians in order to get them to rise up. That was the hope, it didn't work, but to get them to rise up against the Germans, okay? The estimates are as many as 800,000 German civilians were killed in the terror bombing. And she just turned to me and very flatly said, our feeling was, if we're going to die, we're going to take some of them with us. She didn't discriminate between civilians and combatants, because we were talking about the terror bombing directed at civilians. If we're going to die, we're going to take some of them with us. It was impossible, impossible in my home growing up to say any good word about a German or a Pole. But my parents were from Poland or a Pole. Now with Poles, it was more contempt. You know, the Jews had a contempt for Poles. My mother would say, stupid Pole, stupid Pole. Uh, but Germans, it was a raging hatred to the last day of their life, you know? And they were very decent people. Once 
I brought to my home a friend, Cyrus Wieser, who was half German and half Armenian. It was the first time I ever brought anyone of any German extraction to my home. And my mother wanted to rise to the occasion. And she took him aside at the end and just whispered, it's okay that you came. That was the furthest she would go. Now, if you asked what she felt in 1945, because I'm talking about 40 years later, it wouldn't have been okay. So for me, it's expecting something superhuman of the people of Gaza to make anything less than the kind of homicidal statements that my own mother said, if we're going to die, we're going to take some of them with us. I have visited Gaza, not extensively, not extensively, but I have been there. And, you know, for whatever reason, I was treated decently. I lived in the West Bank. I lived in, if you know the, you know the West Bank? Okay, I lived in Beit Sahur, the Christian Palestinian village outside Bethlehem. And I lived in uh, Hebron, right across the street from Fawar camp, Fawar refugee camp. I went back every year from 1988 to 1993. Do I walk away with a memory, and I didn't meet Hamas people, because Hamas was already around back then. Do I walk away with a memory of homicidal fascist maniacs wanting to kill me? If I did, I would say it. And people have accused me of many things, but lying is not one of them, you know? Uh, and I also, errors in my footnotes is not one of them. You can accuse me falsely of selectivity. You can't accuse me of misrepresentation. I have a, so that's my answer. You're asking for something which, to my thinking, is superhuman, that they feel about the Jews having been locked up in that concentration camp for 20 years, what my parents felt for the Germans. It's, okay, wait, sorry, wait sorry, a enough, enough, her, enough. We have to, we have to wrap. Do you, do you want to say anything? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, we, 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 I'm going to hold my tongue. I was going to say something. I'm going to hold my tongue. No, no. Say it and finish. I would accuse you of selectivity, and I hope when we when we meet again that I can mm -hmm. I can try to fine go through it. my book and I show it. I, I have I, I made a whole thing, but I, I thought it was it because I'm supposed to be like I mean third you know mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm, impartial. I didn't want to. Be, I would but just I, tell the listeners, but um, the viewers, I would like to spar with you that on that. This go entire ahead. conversation, yeah. we have seen Mr. Finkelstein analogize the conditions of Gaza to a concentration camp. Yes, he has an Israeli sociologist who said it too. It is a free and open society in Israel. So yes, you will find such people who will say these sorts of things. But he's stealing a base. And he's using, he's starting with this analogy in order to justify homicidal mass murder. And what I would say to him, even though I am younger and I know that he is a scholar, he's written all these books, is that I wish he would evaluate the fact that he cannot bring himself to simply understand that Hamas are the 21st century Nazis, not Israel. But I make bad analogies. Well, you they see? are. If I invoke, they do what, they do I, what the I, Nazis I, do, I, which is just kill the I, Jews. If I invoke the Nazis, it's outrageous. Well, no, but when I, it, he invokes the Nazis, that's permissible. Well, no, no, I'm basing it on what they do. As opposed to right. and my actually, inner demons actually, or whatever. That's I'm exactly thinking. what I did. I based my comment on what they do. Well, I oh, think locking okay. people in a, 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 a camp for 20 years where you can't go in, can't go out, no food, it's for, no a full, food. for a full stomach, one half the population suffers from extreme food insecurity. And now... As we speak, exactly at this moment, fuel is not being admitted, which means the hospitals collapse and the water supply. So why doesn't Hamas okay. give them some uh, of their uh, fuel? Uh, you yeah, know, why, 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 oh, because they have to kill more Jews? Okay, er, uh, Periel, first of all, you don't know that Hamas is not giving the fuel. That's what Israel says, but... 
But but if they are, then what's okay, the problem? Okay, but I am not going by what I know personally. I'm reading the human rights reports, and the human rights reports, as we speak, they're coming out on a daily basis. If the fuel is not admitted, the hospitals will not function and the water will not be drinkable in Gaza. Okay? That's what the human rights organizations are saying. Okay, okay. We're, we're, it's we're, not, we're, we're repeating ourselves It's now. not about, at this moment, it's not about Hamas. It's very convenient, and I'm not saying you're doing it on purpose. She does do it on purpose. No, I'm not saying. <laughs> it's very convenient I, I gotta make a point. to home in on Gaza. I'm talking about, I'm home in the Hamas. I'm talking about the 2.3 million people. 2%, 2% of the food that they normally get, which means normally... It's extreme food, and 2% is being, get, uh, being admitted. Water is drying up. Hospitals are becoming dysfunctional. Now, that, to me, is a murder plan. You may not like to hear it. Okay, sir, But sir. de facto, it's a murder sir. plan. It's a death Professor sentence Fingleson. for the people of Gaza. I'll say, and then we'll finish. First of mm -hmm. all, I'm not, I've said this before. I'm not ready to sign on the dotted line for what Israel is going to to do, I am giving them the benefit of the doubt, and I'll predict here today that Israel is not going to starve Gazans to death. But if they do, I will say Finkelstein was right, I was wrong, and this is this is a, a shame that the Jewish people committed. I don't believe that's going to happen. I wonder if you really think it's going to happen. But there's a lot of bluster and bluffing and and hard fucking nose actions that that people take in wartime. I want to say the following about the Nazis. Conclusory, you know, comparing things to things is is a is a tool. It's a strategy of advocacy to compare something something to the Nazis is a very powerful way to win an argument. Mm -hmm. All I would say is that if you were to compare factually what you've described mm -hmm. as a concentration camp in Gaza, and then I were to list factually to somebody who never heard the word concentration camp, what it meant to be a concentration camp. In, in, in Germany, they would never think of using the same word to describe them both. No, with all, with all you, you, can, you, can, you can find some. Mr. But the, no, the, it, to, a concentration camp implies mass murder. No, that's a death camp. Uh, okay, but that's what well, I understand. There's Bergen, war camps. Yeah, there's war camps and death camps. Ber Bergen Belsen right. was a concentration camp. But you know camp. as well as I do that uh, in the general public the doesn't, the doesn't Jap make the that Jap distinction. The Japanese, what we call them, internment camps. They were concentration camps. Yes, but you know, and, that, you know uh, that people don't make that that fine distinction in in, in in everyday life. And I and I don't know the details of the work camps, mm -hmm. but. Um, when you tell people it's a concentration camp, mm -hmm. I not, believe you know this. You know how ignorant people are. They assume you're comparing it to the worst of Germany. I'm quoting Baruch Kimmerling. All right. Well, that's fine. All right. And, and, yeah, he found one. Right. Um, actually, you want a second? You have another? You got another oh, yeah, I will. I actually, the Gaza Ministry of no, Health, because no, they call no. it that too? I would suspect that you know, you would know Amira Haas. Yeah, I do know Amira Haas. Okay. And Amira Haas's I'm parents were in the were in the camps in World War II. Okay. And she once had to wrestle with that question. And if you're interested, since he said you want to do research after, just Google Amira Haas concentration camp Gaza. She lived there, to her eternal credit. She lived there, and she wrote a book, Drinking... Uh, okay. I, I, I am and, interested, but of course, everybody, everybody can pick yeah. somebody... Yeah esteemed, well, uh, who, who agrees yeah. with them. So it's right. not, it's not a so, evidence. Yeah, but it's not like you're it's, pulling... It's, the question is what's, what, it's not what's something her, like what her pulling, arguments yeah. are. The arguments, Fine, that's yeah. why I yeah. said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Google it, yeah. because okay. Amira, I don't always agree with her, but number one, Amira is a stickler for facts like myself, and she's a political person. All right. And if you read her statements since October 7th, in general, in general, they've been excellent. All right. They've been excellent. And she was... Careful to say, I have friends who've looked into it. There were 
significant atrocities that occurred on October 7th. I defer to her judgment. I know she's not a propagandist, but she was also very careful okay. not to blame okay. the people of Gaza people, for what happened. Okay, Professor, thank you very, very much. What's the name of your book on the, the anti-woke book again? I'll burn that bridge when I get to it. I'll burn that bridge when I get to it. I, I, I want to recommend that book very strongly. Um, Jamie Kirchick, of all people, says, says, I don't know what's going on in the world. Everything's upside down. I'm hearing Norman Finkelstein, and I agree with him on everything because you were talking about this. I saw it, uh, the blogging heads with uh, you and, with Lowry. and Lowry, and I thought you made a lot of very good points about what people think. Because I think for myself, and I struggle with what I think. See it? Yeah. Screen? yeah, yeah. I struggle. I told you. October 7th was not an easy day for me. And then 8th and 9th were very tough days for me because I do recognize I'm not a kid anymore. I'm 70 years old. And I recognize people were going to attach weight to my judgment. And I sat, and actually I was very nervous because I knew I usually, and I've said this before, I usually defer to your namesake, uh, Noam Chomsky, who was my mentor for 40 years. And he wasn't access accessible. Is he yet satisfied that bin Laden did it or not? I know he was, uh, he was uh, tough, tough to convince on that for a while. He said he should have been brought to trial. Can I, I, I ask, okay. wh why wasn't he accessible? I'm, I'm just, I'm I, not, it's not my business. So I, I just want to say that I asked Noam Chomsky if he would write the foreword to my first book. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I still have the, the email. The book about all the oral <laughs> sex she gave out in high school. That's <laughs> not true. That's not what it's about. But I do still have the email from Noam Chomsky. And what did He's, he say? He said no. <laughs> Probably because of the subject matter. It was um, not as racy as Noam's making it sounds. But he did write me back. He wrote me a very nice email back. Uh, what was the very last thing you said before that? I, I said that he wasn't accessible this time. No, before, you, before about Chomsky. Right? What did you say right before that? He was his mentor. No, yeah. but before Chomsky got mentioned, the point you were making. I said that I knew people attached a lot of weight to my judgment. Oh, that, I, that, yeah. So I wrestled with it so, very so, hard. So when we meet and, again. And I, it's the same thing with the book on cancel culture. When we, when we meet again, and, and I'm, I'm uncomfortably um, open to the idea of these psychological arguments, although I, I think the important thing is... is whether or not it's fair to say that this is a, a comparable situation. But the question then becomes, okay, well, they killed uh, 1,200. How about 12,000? How about 120,000? You know, once you start forgiving these types of actions, or if you don't want to use the word forgiving, whatever word you would have to awkwardly use to describe what you're saying, short of saying this is unacceptable because it's murder— then you're you're in never never land. You're 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 there's the floor is gone and you're floating around because it can you find yourself all of a sudden endorsing mass murder. That's what happens when you cut these ties. And I would you know, want war, to I want to explore that with you. In the war, war is mass murder. Yes, but I'm saying in, in, if it's okay in, for Hamas in, to kill 1,200. In, in, in Nat Turner, it was 60 whites were killed. John Brown, it was fewer. The Civil War. Was believe it or not, I mean, it's kind of an astonishing figure. Do you know how many Americans were killed during the Civil War? 700,000. There were only 300,000 Americans killed during World War II. And how many, Ger Se how many, how many Russians died in World War II? 30 million? Estim estimates between 27 and 30 million I mean, Russians. It, it, astounding, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we have to go. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Everybody, thank mm -hmm. you. Good night. Well, yeah. thank, one second. Sure. Thank you. My pleasure. I think you've made an honest, good faith effort to be fair, and that's all I want. I don't agree with Eli. However, I respect the fact that he stayed. And things I said you must have found painful to endure. And um, I can't say what you said I found painful to endure because I hear it quite a lot. Uh, on the other hand, I do believe I'm old-fashioned. I do believe the truth comes out in the, con in the uh, conflict of opinions. And then the viewers can listen, and when they are doubtful, they can check. And that's the way I think tr truth is discovered. Thank you very much. And I also want to say thank you to Perio. No, you know, I was making eye contact with you because I wanted not to be caught in the polar, the polls, but somebody who's just listening. And I could see you were listening. And that's been a gratifying experience. Uh, 
in the past couple of weeks, do you know who gave me the most uh, respectful uh, hearing? Me? No. Uh, what's her name? It begins with M. Peterson. What's her name? Yeah, the uh, Jordan Peterson's daughter. Jordan Peterson's daughter. What's her name? I don't know her. Um, begins Marguerite, with, I think. No, I no, no. Uh, Michaela. Yeah. Michaela Peterson. Uh, and it was a very striking moment for me because she never does politics. And she listened, she processed, and you could see her face. She was listening. And the podcast, it got, as of now, it's already 350,000 views. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And I was very glad because her father does not like what I say, you know. <laughs> right, right. But you listened. But you listened. And so I'm grateful to all of you for that. And I listened. And I wish you all the best. You too. Okay. Did you want to say something else? No, we're good. Okay, good night, everybody. Thank good you for night. that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.